been a great pleasure to introduce in this observation modeling session that I think probably needs to know question at this point, uh, Hans Pro from the University Institute of Brain Sciences. Great, thank you, Dan. And I just uh, want to point out I have the uh, co-authors on this talk. So Joey will answer all the questions about PCO2. And Chris will answer all the questions about DOC uh, in my talk. So uh, I'm going to talk about a program which we've had for 25 years, plus years, uh, ModMod, uh, stands for modeling and something, modeling and monitoring. And um, it's going to be focused on North Carolina's uh, Albemarle Pamlico Sound System. And uh, just a quick introduction on this system for those who are not familiar with it. It's the uh, second largest estuary complex in the country. Uh, it's just, as you can tell, it's a, a lagoonal system. So it's got a long residence time. Uh, it's very important from a fisheries and resource perspective. It drains about half of North Carolina's coastal plain and the Southeastern Virginia section or area, and it's had 50 years of agricultural urban expansion, accompanying uh, enhanced nutrient loading in the system. I already mentioned it was lagoonal, and the other thing uh, is that uh, we have experienced a upswing or uptick in hurricanes and, or tropical cyclones now, 34 in the last, uh, I think I should include one more, uh, 35 I think in the last 25 years. So. We're heavily impacted, and what I'm going to talk about is uh, essentially the hot the hot zone that we're in in uh, the Alamo Pamlico Sound System. And you can see here that the uh, change in annual number of days with precipitation greater than three inches has increased dramatically. So some most of that is tropical cyclones, but also we get a lot of big rainfall events now and other at other times of the year. And uh, this particular uh, slide over here just shows you the tracks of all those storms that we've had over the last uh, 25 plus years or so. Uh, this is not a slide you want to show if you're selling real estate, although it doesn't matter too much. People are still crazy about living there. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you, uh, focus on uh, the recent hurricanes, uh, starting with Dennis Floyd and Irene uh, back in 1999 and Ernesto. 2006, Matthew, 2015, Florence, 2018. Uh, I'll talk about some other storms too, but those are really the main ones that I'll be concerned with. So one of the big things, of course, is to try to separate human impacts from climatic impacts that are impacting our uh, system, and in fact, most coastal systems. Um, and that's really where Modmon got born um, uh, back in 1994 because we needed a monitoring system that was more intense than what the state is doing, uh, although it does complement some of the state's uh, monthly monitoring. And one of the big issues is eutrophication, uh, leading to algal blooms that uh, we've been having both in the freshwater marine section. And uh, back in the early 90s, uh, we recognized that nitrogen was a big problem in eutrophication, so there is a TMDL, total maximum daily load, in place on how much nitrogen can be loaded into the system. The monitoring programs, and I'll really focus on just one, is uh, MODMON, which stands again for modeling and monitoring. Uh, since 1994, bi-weekly from spring to fall, and then monthly in the winter time. Uh, but I'm also, we're also running another program called FERRYMON, which uses the North Carolina uh, ferries to do autonomous water quality monitoring. And then lastly, we have been uh, putting in place autonomous vertical profiler. So you can see kind of how they collect the data there. This is ModMod, this is FerryMod. FerryMod's very high resolution stuff, you know, along the track of the ferry. This is chlorophyll, by the way, uh, just showing you blooms over time. And the vertical profiling just, you know, it's one place, but it's very intensive data going up and down the system. And here are the number of stations that we have sampled with ModMod. Here's the ferry mod tracks. And we have put some of these vertical profilers in place along the noose. Okay, so getting into the uh, impacts of hurricanes and tropical cyclones, I just wanted to show you what it looks like when we get hit by one of these events. So this is uh, uh, Florence back in 2018. 
And just to get you oriented, uh, this, this is the upstream part of my mind up here, uh, up in the freshwater section of the Moose River. And then here's the entrance to Pamlico Sound. And here are just uh, different uh, parameter profiles that you can see there. Um, salinity, uh, temperature, DO, uh, pH, and chlorophyll. And I just wanted to show you how these, uh, how these storms can overwhelm the system and lead to a freshening of the estuary really quickly, but also how we can get this stratification going because out in Pamlico Sound, that's a big system with a long residence time. So what you see is this fresh water kind of laying over the salt water. And that, of course, can lead to all sorts of issues, including hypoxia, because the water is not mixing in these uh, downstream places. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, this one here, this is the DO. Uh, actually, the, the blue is the, most, is the least amount of oxygen, uh, and the green and red is the most amount of oxygen in the system. So you can see this hypoxia building up when we have this overlaying sort of oil and vinegar situation uh, in our estuary. Um, okay, that's enough for that one. All right, I'm a, a nutrient guy, uh, although Chris has turned me into a carbon guy or a nutrient and carbon guy. Uh, and I wanted to show you how important these events are in terms of delivering nitrogen, which is the upper part in here, and phosphorus uh, to the Noose River estuary. So these are loads. And what you can see, I don't have to put my other glasses on here. What you can see here is that in years where we have hurricanes, so this is uh, starting in 96, this is Fran, by the way, most people living here in Raleigh who have been here for a long time remember Fran, because it did a job on Raleigh. Uh, you can see that these uh, storms deliver a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus relative to what we call the, the uh, sort of typical anthropogenic uh, pattern that we see. So this would be the spring runoff, uh, and that's mostly anthropogenic nitrogen that's coming uh, from runoff uh, into our system. But when you get a hurricane or several hurricanes, uh, as much as 80% of the load uh, to the system is basically associated with these storms. So they're incredibly important in terms of nutrient uh, delivery so estuaries, and here's the TM uh, percentage increase over baseline conditions when we get a storm, and here's phosphorus. So they're really, they're uh, big events delivering lots of nutrients. And those nutrients then get picked up by the phytoplankton, and because we have a long residence time system, you can actually see sequentially how those uh, loads translate into phytoplankton production. And that's what uh, those spinning cyclones are all about. So, you know, if we look at the uh, Fran, for example, back in 96, we had a huge impact of chlorophyll, which is the biomass indicator. Here's Dennis Floyd and Irene, and then here's Isabel back in uh, 2003, and Ernesto, which actually was the tropical storm um, back in 2006. But you can also see there are other events that are not tropical cyclones, that we have like wet summer periods, for example, that also play a role in this uh, sort of uh, enhancement of chlorophyll production. So that's one of the tricks here is to separate an event scale thing like a tropical storm with what we see seasonally in terms of hydrologic loading in the system. And this is just a long-term record showing you going from zero, which is up here in Newburn, to the entrance to Pamlico Sound. Uh, this is chlorophyll, so this is our uh, indicator of phytoplankton production. Uh, we weren't sampling Pamlico Sound until, uh, until about 99, so this is just the upper part of the Newson here, and then we ventured into Pamlico Sound when we got a little bit more money from the state after those three hurricanes hit us. Uh, and I remember getting a call from the governor's office, by the way, uh, asking me, in the, the News and Observer in Raleigh had a huge picture of Pamlico Sound full of mud after uh, those three hurricanes. And I was asked, well, Dr. Pearl, what, you know, what does this mean in terms of water quality? And my answer was, we don't know because nobody is sampling Pamlico Sound. You know. And that's how Ferrymon was born, using the ferries to actually uh, go across Pamlico Sound. Okay, just an you know, storms can be opportunistic, but now we have those two monitoring programs in place. But you can see here Dennis Floyd and Irene 
big increases in phytoplankton production. And it wasn't just, you know, a week later. Some of these storms can have effects that last months or so because the uh, sediments that are coming in with the storms are getting reworked and you're getting nutrient uh, released from those over time. Uh, Isabel, uh, Ernesto, uh, they don't have to be big hurricanes, by the way. Ernesto was a tropical storm. And then you can see this upswing here that we've seen in the last five years or so, uh, ten, five to 10 years with uh, more intense storm events that we've seen. So, uh, so there's a pretty clear linkage here between major perturbations, storms, and uh, enhancement of chlorophyll and also harmful algal blooms that we're seeing in the system. And this is one example of a harmful algal bloom in response to a tropical storm. Ernesto again, back in 2006. Uh, this is the noose on its side, it's sort of like an ant farm. I don't know if you, most, most probably aren't old enough to know what an ant farm is, but uh, looking at it from the side. So here's the fresh water coming in, overlaying the salt water. This is the gradient and salinity in the system. And then right, at, right where you see this intense uh, change in stratification, uh, we get an increase in chlorophyll A, and that is a, a uh, it was a uh, toxic um, dinoflagellate bloom in this particular instance. So, you know, it's a combination of nutrient loading, uh, stratification, and residence time that is combined in terms of seeing what the effects are over time. And this is a very confined part of the estuary where the bloom occurred. And this is the cells, the carlidinium cells that we saw, which were counted by the NOAA lab in Beaufort. And this is the toxicity, the toxin production. And we were able to uh, forecast that there would be a fish kill there uh, over time in response to this bloom. And sure enough, after uh, two weeks or so, the fish were coming up uh, belly up on both sides of the estuary. So, you know, there's very strong physical chemical combinations here to uh, uh, cause these blooms to form. Uh, this is just some data from Dennis Floyd and Irene in 99, the three hurricanes that came within six weeks. They changed the chemical sound here from a uh, mesohaline system to a freshwater system. Lots of water, short period of time. And the system overflowed like a giant bathtub. And you can see the sediment laden water here being ejected by the Gulf Stream out into the, uh, over the shelf. And this is chlorophyll. So you can see there was a fairly uh, immediate response here, uh, two to you know, a couple of weeks to months. But then here's a secondary peak uh, in the following spring. So this is probably reworked sediments and regeneration of nutrients in the system from the storm. So this is one of the nice things, that, and this is my big selling point for Pamlico Sound, it's got a long residence time, so we can see these effects over uh, multiple months uh, and, and years. And everything else was sort of off for several years after the storm. The shrimp left, the crabs left. And it, uh, in the case of crabs, we didn't get the crabs back until about six years later. Um, this is just to show you pre-hurricane. This is a uh, sea whiffs picture before it went off the air. Uh, pre-hurricane, and then we, uh, this is uh, about two weeks afterwards, and you can see all this brown stained uh, humic water uh, coming into Pamlico Sound. And this is what it looked like when we went out on our boat at the, at, at the edge of that uh, fresh head that was coming into the system. The other thing about uh, storms and uh, hydrologic loading and residence time is that uh, monitoring programs are good, but sometimes you know things get beyond what we can even monitor. And a good example of that is uh, what happened here uh, over a period uh, in 2002, where we had uh, moderate flow, moderate to low flow, dry period. You can see the chlorophyll up here at the head, heads of the estuary. The Pamlico Sound is is you know less than uh, four micrograms or so. Then the flow increased after a, uh, 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 this, was not, this was a uh, moderate storm event that we had, but you can see the flow increased, which uh, put more nutrients in there downstream, but it also pushed the phytoplankton downstream. And then here's the, the, the uh, uh, we had a tropical uh, depression here, which increased the flow to a really great extent. 
And essentially the phytoplankton were uh, flushed out of the system before they could actually take up the nutrients. So the real response was out here in Pamlico Sound. So I just wanted to point this out in terms of the monitoring and assessment. Uh, you know, it, it's really good to have uh, extensive monitoring, but sometimes you need additional help. And in this case, we had remote sensing to help us uh, delineate the effect. Episodic events are really important. This is actually from the New River Estuary, which is just uh, down, the, down the coast from where we are. Uh, and this is vertical profiler data. So uh, these are uh, YSI multi-probe uh, uh, multi sons. And what I wanted to show you is what it looked like in terms of temperature, salinity, uh, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, and turbidity. And we had the good fortune, or bad fortune, depends on how you look at it, of having a tropical storm, Hannah, from over the system, Here's the wind field, and you can see how it homogenized everything in the shallow water column, uh, temperature, salinity, uh, DO. And we had a bloom prior to the uh, passage of uh, Hannah. And then, of course, the, the storm mixed everything up. Here's the turbidity maximum, the resuspended sediments in the system. And look at the bloom. It actually was bigger after the event than uh, b before. Most people think that, you know, storms are good because they flush everything out of the system, but not here. And we think that the intensification of this bloom was due to re sediment resuspension, releasing nutrients back up into the, into the water column. And then, of course, you also have nutrients coming in from the watershed. But this was a pretty quick response within a few days. Uh, and it just, I think it's a very good uh, uh, slide to show you how uh, time, space, uh, monitoring is really important in terms of understanding the impacts of these events. If we would have done a monthly uh, sampling, we would have never been, uh, really been able to pinpoint what was going on with the sediment resuspension, which turned out to be really important. Okay, so changing the carbon, uh, how's carbon flux impacted uh, by these storms in the system? Uh, this is, uh, I forget which storm this is, Joey, do you know? I think it's one that Irene, uh, there have been so many that I've forgotten the names of them, except the more recent ones. Uh, and so here's kind of a conceptual diagram of uh, how things, uh, uh, with regard to carbon cycling, how things work in the estuary prior to the storm and then afterwards. And you can see the, uh, uh, and the coloration basically is the increase in colored organic matter in the system. Uh, the really important parts here are the DOC that's coming in, uh, as well as carbon, uh, POC, but also the, the uh, system tends to uh, uh, produce more CO2 due to respiration, for example, out of the system into the atmosphere. And I'll show you a conceptual diagram of, of this later on. And here you can see the uh, discharge associated with uh, going well beyond the estuary into the coastal zone. And Chris has a great paper out on this, um, 2019, which I'm sure he's willing to share. So uh, this is the potential sources and pathways that we're, that we're talking about, starting with the, uh, the watershed, rivers. Uh, damming is really important because it controls not only hydrology, but also residence time downstream in the system, which is important for uh, phytoplankton production and harmful algal blooms. And then we get the mineralization going on in estuaries and then into the coastal zone. The CO2, of course, is the terminal product of DOC and POC degradation, largely through microbes. And I'll show you a little bit on that. And the other thing is DOC is more than its concentration alone. And this is one of the really important questions is what part of that DOC pool is being utilized versus what part stays around for a long time. This is really a ongoing research activity. Okay, uh, this is really Joey's work. Uh, and I'm hoping that I can describe it uh, without getting too, into too much trouble. So one of the questions was, what's happening with CO2 during these storm events in terms of in, input versus output and flux? And Joey equipped our research vessel here, the 26-foot uh, Parker that we used to sample, with a flow-through system by which he can look at uh, CO2 
uh, PCO2 basically uh, entering uh, or leaving the system uh, through air, water, CO2 flux. So I'll show you some data on this uh, in a second. Okay, so what happens in terms of CO2 flux when we get these storm events versus non-storm events? And this zero line basically is the, is the, is the input is, is equal to the output in the system. So when we get uh, dry periods where there isn't much uh, um, um, disturbance and perturbation in the system, you can see that it's very autotrophic and there's, the CO2 is largely coming in, PCO2 is coming in. But then when we get these storm events, and you see they come in pulses, there's a lot of CO2 being vented back up into the atmosphere. Uh, this is from the Neuse River, and this is the New River, uh, same time periods. Uh, Joey worked with another student of mine, Bryce uh, Van Dam, to do this work. And uh, the take home message from this, and this is in Joey's paper, 2014, is that one cyclone, in this case, Isabel, can liberate as much CO2 as is fixed annually by the phytoplankton. So that's a big deal uh, in terms, if you're looking at things like eutrophication uh, and, and the net production that's going on in the system, but also important in terms of, you know, how much CO2 is actually vented back up in the atmosphere by these events. Dissolved organic carbon flux is strongly affected as well, as you might guess. And, you know, it, this is just some summarized stuff that Chris had put down. Uh, organic matter is dissolved organic matter is consumed by heterotrophs. I'll show you a little bit of data on that. Uh, that supports the food web. It also contributes to acidity and alkalinity, depending on the watershed, of course, and what's coming in from there. And then we get this complexation with metals uh, that's uh, also important, although we ha I haven't looked at that. And then lastly, uh, sunlight, you know, CDOM is absorbing sunlight. So that's actually leading to uh, changes in transparency in the water column, but also uh, photooxidation uh, reactions that are going on uh, in the estuary itself. And here's a DOC equivalent of the nutrients that I uh, mentioned from storms. And you can see it's pretty similar to the picture that we see for nitrogen and phosphorus. So these storms dominate the DOC input to our system. There's you know, uh, no doubt about that. If you look at the, uh, the influence of these storms in terms of the uh, baseline, uh, you can see large increases here in DOC and POC as well. Uh, this is a data slide from Hurricane Matthew back in 2016 just showing you what happens uh, in terms of pr uh, production in the system versus the DOC load. And this is the hydro, this is the discharge into the new server. And here we get Matthew coming in. Uh, we had some, you know, production and bloom activity. The blooms essentially get washed out of the system into Pamlico Sound. But here's the big DOC uh, signal that we see during that event. And importantly, the blooms actually come back, and they come back larger than they were uh, initially prior to this event. So again, uh, this is not all due to DOC, it's probably due to other nutrients associated with it, but it just shows you how dynamic the system is and how important it is to monitor this over a space and time. There are some, uh, there, we have run some experiments looking at how uh, reactive uh, DON in this case, DON might be uh, relative to DIN and phosphorus. This is uh, data uh, from uh, Julia Altman, who worked with us on the New River and New Server. And what, I don't think you can see this, but here's the DON my, uh, concentration in the system uh, from a, a storm event. And the uh, in this case, the dinoflagellates uh, in the system really benefited from this relative to other uh, harmful algal bloom taxa. So it all depends on who can utilize these nutrients and what the impacts are gonna be in terms of not only primary production, but what we get out of the system in terms of uh, potential harmful algal blooms. Uh, the DOC that comes in from these storms is being utilized for sure, because you can also see that uh, respiration rates, the consumption of this organic matter goes up during the storm event. And this is actually data from my son, who's here at NC State, 
showing you the mineralization rates uh, associated with, uh, in this case, uh, Hurricane Florence. So we do know, we know that it, there's, there's a certain amount that's bioreactive. We need to know who the players are. We need to know how much they can remove and what the ultimate impacts are in, tro in terms of trophic state and the qual and water quality. Um, wetlands are important. We have a lot of wetlands that are in the uh, watersheds in North Carolina in our coastal zone. Uh, this is just showing you the connectivity basically between the wetlands and the main stem of the Moose River coming down. Uh, and uh, a lot of the organic matter is flushed out of the wetlands into the main stem. Uh, and we know that wetlands contribute VOC to rivers. This is not data from the news, but it just shows you how important wetlands are in terms of uh, CDOM yield uh, versus uh, watershed percent, percent uh, watershed percent of the uh, of the wetlands. Uh, this is data from a lot of different places, and uh, it just shows you how important they are as well. Uh, in the Noose River, uh, uh, and Chris will have to explain this later, uh, we can see that a certain amount of the DOC that we do see in Pamlico Sound is associated with wetlands based on uh, isotopic signatures and uh, SUVA, which is a uh, fluorescent indicator. All right, last, almost there. So uh, this is a sketch that Joey made in terms of what happens prior to the uh, impact of the hurricane, during the storm, and after the storm. And what I wanted to point out is that this is the, uh, the old, you know, organic matter signal coming in. So prior to the storm, the system, the chlorophyll is upstream, you know, the flushing rate's low. Then we get the storm coming in, which flushes the phytoplankton and production downstream, but it's also adding a lot of DOC to the system. Uh, and these arrows, by the way, show you the CO2 flux. So the CO2 flux is pretty low because the phytoplankton are, are assimilating most of it. And then during the storm, you get this big pulse of CO2 leaving the system. And then afterwards, uh, there's still PCO2 leaving because a lot of the organic matter is being processed in the, in the estuary. And, uh, and the phytoplankton are coming back because the residence time is starting to increase again in the system. So very dynamic system. All right, last slide. What are the big picture concerns that we would have as ecologists in these systems? Uh, we know that things are increasing in terms of the number of storm events. And one thing we're really concerned about in the Elmar Pamlico South system is, you know, what's the ecosystem response going to look like if we have intensification of these storms? So that, you know, here's the uh, recovery phase, and then we're getting impacted again by another storm. So the system is sort of in disequilibrium from the uh, more intense and more frequent storms that we're getting. And, you know, we're really concerned about that, not only in terms of harmful algal blooms, but the food chain and uh, fisheries um, um, yields in the Pamlico Sound. And then the last thing, worrisome feedback. This is my own kind of um, conceptualization of this. If we get more intense storms, uh, that's going to lead to more carbon mobilization, more CO2 released. And of course, that could lead to, that's part of the driver again for intensification of hurricanes because of the uh, greenhouse effect. So this is kind of an evil spiral here. Uh, more hurricanes leading to more CO2 being vented from all these sources, leading to uh, increased warming and more hurricanes. And where this is all going to end, no, I don't know. But anyway, it's something to be uh, concerned with. And lastly, I just wanted to thank uh, the sources of funding for all this. Modmont's still going on, thanks to the North Carolina legislature uh, and, uh, and Ferrymont as well. And if any of you have any uh, interest in using any of our data for anything, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, we have a wonderful website manager over there, Alex. And uh, well, both those guys. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Maybe this is for Joey, but do you have a sense of how much of that CO2 being vented from the estuary is derived from in situ processes versus CO2 from the soils and river? Is it a bunch of river CO2 getting it? Joey, want to answer that? We look at smaller and and somebody in a more tractable system tried to close the budget a bit better with how much it's coming from 
in situ, how much is coming through the river, how much is coming from lateral as well. Um, and it, it depends on the system. Um, I would say in the figure that Lon showed, one of the biggest uncertainties is what's actually happening during the storm because the, you know we have an example, some arrows there during storm processes, but we still really haven't measured it. So uh, it's a big burning question. Thank you. So it gives me the pleasure to thank you once again and to introduce Nick Ward from Pacific Northwest National Lab. We'll be talking to us about the Compass program. All right, thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me? We're good. All right. So, uh, Great pleasure to be speaking in front of this awesome crowd. Um, I'm going to talk about a new DOE project that started about a year and a half ago, and we're just starting to have some measurements being made this summer. Um, I will add that this large-scale multi-institutional project, you can see all of our partners on the bottom there, it's about 10 different institutions involved, about 60-plus different scientists, postdocs, um, and students across. All right, sorry about that. There you go. Um, so like I was saying, this is a large project, lots of institutions, both academic um, and national labs and other federal entities like the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Um, they're quite collaborative. And I wanted to add that this program kind of blossomed out of workshops like this. So um, about five or six years ago, there was a DOE workshop on how to represent terrestrial aquatic interfaces in Earth system models. Um, from that, Kim and I led another workshop fo focusing in on um, the coastal system and ultimately it turned into this large program. Not everyone at those workshops um, were funded by the project, but they've all been involved in things like paper writing, uh, reviews and whatnot. So just motivation for getting good products out of things like this. Um, I want to add, we started this project during COVID. Um, it's a great example of using things like Zoom uh, with people you'd never met building a team. And I think we did a pretty good job of team building uh, even in a totally remote environment. So the outline for the talk I'm going to give today is just a quick background and overview of this project. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the general approach we use for both um, modeling and observing these ecosystems. And I think some of the approaches that we've deployed at this kind of scale are relevant for what we've been talking about in the breakouts yesterday, for example. Um, and then I'll give you some examples of data from our first year of uh, field season. And I'm trying to put this in the context of extreme events. Um, this project in general is aimed at understanding mechanistic uh, insight about how coastal systems process. Disturbances are one part of that, but definitely not the central angle, but I'll show you some unpublished data. Um, all of this is just hot off the press. Uh, people are digitizing their field notebooks as we speak. So large scale vision for this project is to develop a mechanistic understanding of coastal ecosystem functions uh, needed to support scalable process rich modeling. Our end goal is to deploy um, or to represent the complexity of coastal ecosystems in global scale earth system models. Um, the top figure shows how we currently represent, um, well, don't represent coastal systems in these large scale global models. We have great land models, we have great, great ocean models, and we have some fresh water going into the ocean. Um, this challenge isn't necessarily what Compass is undertaking. This is a larger mission of the Department of Energy. So we have a one division dedicated to Earth system modeling, and they developed the exascale energy Earth system model. It's one of, uh, the, they like to say, one of the world's most cutting edge uh, Earth system models. So that program is being tasked with how to represent these finite systems that can be hundreds of meters in scale across this it's wet and transect in a model that has 100 kilometer square grids. So that's not our problem to tackle. They're figuring out how to get the subgrid heterogeneity, heterogeneity and whatnot to represent the processes that we tell them are important. So we focus in on much smaller scales, the scale of molecules to transects. Um, so our study looks across a series of coastal transects, um, really with um, the angle of looking from the land into the water. Um, so Department of Energy doesn't want to step on NOAA's toes. They want us to take this place where we're looking from the land to the water where the other agencies look from the water into the land. On top of that, we're interested in how both chronic and um, punctuated disturbances impact these fundamental ecosystem dynamics. So for example, sea level rise, lake level variability, um, storm surge and whatnot. We uh, have been tasked with studying two major, major regions in the US. Uh, one is the Mid-Atlantic region and one is the Great Lakes region. Um, these have nice contrasting um, and complementary characteristics Characteristics. So obviously in the Chesapeake Bay and Mid-Atlantic, we have tides and salt. 
Um, in the Great Lakes region, we actually have quite large variability in lake levels akin to sea level rise. And that is quite interesting. So I'll show that on this next slide, some historic water levels uh, that really exemplify the distinct hydrological regimes in these two regions. Um, so on the top, we're looking at um, sea level in the mid-Atlantic over the last um, 80 years or so. And as we all know, sea level rise is this creeping, um, slow increase. And uh, we've had about a couple inches in the last decade. And we hypothesized that this would lead to somewhat linear ecosystem change um, or maybe one directional. So you might have wetlands marching inland. The lakes, on the other hand, I'm showing lake level for Lake Erie. In the last decade al um, alone, we've had about two feet of lake level rise. And so this can result in much uh, quicker ecosystem change. Also, in the next decade, we're expecting lake levels to drop again. So we might have bi-directional change in these ecosystem structure um, with resulting changes in ecosystem function. Um, you also have extreme events. So when you have wind storms on the lakes, you can, I've seen with my own eyes, lake level drop by a few feet, and then you come back the next day and it's up to your ankles. Um, so these seiche events can be akin to tides or even storm surge where one side of the lake gets super high levels and the other gets super low levels. I didn't really mention it. I think I had it in some earlier or later slides that I didn't upload um, that one of the that soil saturation and water level are some of the key drivers that we're interested in and how those, those factors influence. Um, you know, maybe I just read right through that first slide. <laughs> I was supposed to say it here where we're interested in how soil saturation um, influences aerobic and anaerobic conditions at these interfaces. So, um, Sorry, I changed my slides last night and didn't upload them. <laughs> um, I, I sort of alluded to our really central focus on improving models. Um, the Department of Energy has what they call uh, the MODEX approach, which is model experiment integration. And so all of the observations I'm going to talk about are going to be guided by the models that we want to improve. I won't talk much about models beyond this slide, uh, but just that that justification of the, the way we, we go around designing field experiments is we define we describe what the models need, what are the data gaps, and then do some modeling and figure out what the next gaps are. Um, so this first step along the way, basically we couple across different scales from the microbial to the reaction to a transect. Um, with these coupled models, we can do sensitivity analyses and tell the global scale modelers really got to get tides and salinity right if you want to represent the coast um, in your global scale models. So going from the reaction scale, we use um, products such as the DOE's knowledge base or K-base. Um, this is a way to basically ingest high-res mass spectrometry data so we can run samples on an FTICRMS, for example, um, and insert it into this database to extract reaction, reaction networks. So this is sort of getting at some of the questions to Julia this morning on how do you model the reactivity of DOM. Um, so this is one tool that DOE's developed to use high-res mass spec data to start to get at kinetics for different compound classes and different uh, basically molecular structure. Um, we feed this data into a microbially explicit model um, originally called MEND, which was designed for solid phase soils. Um, through Compass, we've developed AquaMEND, which is basically taking that same structure and putting it in the aqueous phase. Um, so that's, we can start doing really detailed studies of pore water chemistry, um, redox reactions, and how that drives organic matter transformations. A lot of these types of models are done at zero D scale. So we might do an experiment uh, where we run just a batch experiment and we're modeling that experiment in a zero D frame. Those sorts of um, reaction networks can be put into re reactive transport models. So we're really interested in how things change um, subsurface dynamics along this transect, transect from coastal forests to wetlands to ultimately surface waters. Um, we use various models to simulate hydrology, such as the advanced terrestrial simulator. Um, and also vegetation dynamics, such as ELM, which is the, um, the land component of the Earth system model that we're interested in. One final point on this slide is we also are interested in um, plant dynamics, plant die-off, and changes of plant communities. We use a model called FATES Hydro, which also interfaces with the Earth system model, um, and that's capable of predicting how forests will die and shift um, and whatnot. And we're also applying that now to the marsh for the first time. So I'll leave, that's enough modeling for today. I'm gonna to talk about some of the observations we do. 
Um, so we have sort of three scales of measurement activities. I'm going to start from the bottom up um, just because that's the way we drew this figure. Um, the first is aimed at really gathering uh, understanding of regional variability. So Allison, who's here, um, has started a, a collaborative consortium that we call Exchange, which basically sends standardized kits around um, these regions and has collaborators help collect samples across their transects of interest. Um, these are snapshots. Um, we've done one campaign where we've got detailed measurements of soils across these transects and surface water. And then we can build on that to capture extreme events, for example, with this community. Um, the next level up is what we're calling synoptic studies. Um, so we've established three field sites in both regions, so three per region, where we've equipped um, a whole bunch of different sensors. You can see wells in that picture there, um, where we have subsurface monitoring, surface water monitoring, soil monitoring, as well as vegetation monitoring, um, with looking at things like sap flow in the trees and how they respond to um, disturbance. Each site has about 100 parameters being measured every 15 minutes. So we've got about 600 different parameters coming in via the cloud. Um, every During this talk, even, we collected 1,200 data points. I skipped past the very top one, and these are experiments that span different scales from a batch to a whole experiment, um, ecosystem experiment I'll tell you about. And really, a lot, all of these activities are aimed at building mechanistic understanding. Um, and with that mechanistic understanding, I think we can start to understand impacts of disturbances and whatnot on fluxes. So just a little more, um, I kind of gave a lot of spoiler for this slide. Um, we've been successful at deploying about 50 kits across these two regions. You can see a map showing DOC concentrations of the surface waters. I won't dig into what that means other than uh, to show you a map of where we've collected a lot of these samples. And we've also performed some experiments with those soils that you see on the bottom. And talk to Allison after the talk if you want to hear more about that program or participate. Uh, these are the locations of our synoptic sites. So we actually have four in the Chesapeake Bay region, and we designed these trans these sites to um, cover kind of regional gradients. So in the Chesapeake, that gradient is mostly um, a salinity gradient, but also geomorphic. Um, so we have a site up in the less saline area, um, down sort of the mid area on the uh, eastern shore, and then a tidal freshwater site, Sweet Palm Marsh, and then a pretty saline site, the Goodwin Islands, um, down near the entrance of Chesapeake Bay. On Lake Erie, and we, we specifically focused in on Lake Erie because it's the shallowest lake, and we think this terrestrial interface is most dynamic on that system. Um, we've set up sites at three locations with varying uh, sort of soil underlying soil characteristics as our gradient there. I'm going to skip through this slide because I already mentioned all the data we're collecting, but we can go back to this if people have specific questions of the type of sensors we have deployed at the sites. Um, and finally, I'll describe just briefly the sort of scales of experiments that we go from. So we've done quite a few batch experiments with soils or water in a lab um, that you just incubate for a few days or week. We've done core scale measurements. You're looking at oxygen concentrations in an inundated core, I believe, using optodes. Um, down on this one, we've analyzed samples and also done experiments at the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Lab. Um, and that's a pretty cool tool that's only been used pretty recently for looking at um, redox chemistry in soils. So there we're seeing shifts in iron speciation, for example, using uh, this X-ray system. Um, we've also performed a soil monolith transplant experiment where we basically took soils from the shoreline and switched them with soils from the upland. Um, we've gone up a salinity gradient where we do basically switching cores around um, from saline to freshwater um, interfaces. And then finally, this is an exciting experiment. I'll give you some of our very first results from um, an ecosystem level um, manipulation experiment where we've set up 2,000 square meter plots that's 50 by 50 meters roughly. Um, and we flooded them with um, equivalent of a hurricane amount of rain basically. Um, so the, digging in more to that last experiment I just told you about, we've got it this this cool name Tempest, or the Temperate Ecosystem Manipulation for Probing the Effects of Storm Treatments. Um, so you heard about studies by Greg yesterday about um, space for time analysis of how these ghost forests have formed. Um, so we typically go study that very last box on the right. Um, we've now designed this experiment to basically start all the way on the left and work our way that way through a decade scale experiment when we continue dumping water. Um, this is not replicated, but we have years of, um, we don't have replicate plots. We have basically a seawater plot, a freshwater plot, and a control plot. Uh, but we've collected a couple of years of before treatment data from all three plots. 
Um, so this summer we did our very first inundation with about 300,000 liters of seawater and also fresh water over a day long period. Um, I'll mention the beauty of this type of experiment. So we could set up sites and catch a hurricane, but with this setup, we had 30 scientists in the field measuring everything imaginable because we knew it was going to happen on this day. Um, we could mobilize teams from across the country and go measure what happened to this forest. So I'm going to give you with whatever time I have left, um, a little bit of an overview of just some of the data that excited me um, that we've, we've seen coming in so far. Um, and I'm going to put it in terms of some of these extreme events like seiches, king tides, barrier breaches, which we get at one of our sites, and also the artificial hurricane storm surge that we generated. Um, a few just fun pictures. Um, the left here is one of our sites in Lake Erie called Old Woman Creek. And that's an interesting site in that it gets a barrier formed at the mouth of that river that drains off um, and floods the whole thing. So on the top picture, you see what it looks like under dry conditions. Um, and then on the bottom is what happens when that barrier forms. So it'll flood for weeks to months. And then at, once the barrier breaches, it flows right out. Um, or if uh, the neighbors bring their backhoe and dig it out sometimes. Um, you'll see on the middle picture, this is a king tide at our shoreline plot of that Tempest experiment. So this was a natural flooding um, of our non-experimental plots a little closer to the shoreline. Um, and then the, it may be a little hard to see, but the picture on the right we, is the creek that we formed during our inundation experiment. So we actually generated surface runoff from the plots. All right, so I'm gonna go through some, some data. This is um, not looking at temporal trends as much, but getting sort of a sense of these systems. So we look across transects from the wetland to this transition zone, it was like that ghost forest area that uh, we heard about yesterday, to a healthy upland forest. And if we look at subsurface redox across these, these, these zones, um, it's fairly expected, but we see low redox, uh, negative redox levels in the marsh zone. Um, it's generally anoxic soils. Um, and in the upland, they're generally oxic soils. This transition zone is quite dynamic, both with depth, but also through the repeated monthly measurements we've made to be quite dynamic in time. And this is that variable saturated zone um, that is constantly changing. On the right-hand side, you'll see some prelim data from the exchange program where they are just um, quantifying water content across this transect. And again, that transition zone, as you would expect, is quite dynamic. Sometimes it can look like a wetland, sometimes it looks like an upland. Um, an anecdote that our team has sort of made while looking at some of our prelim data is that there seems to be a temporal disconnect between these different ecosystem components. And by that, I mean the water, the soil, and the vegetation. Um, so the water will react instantly. If you have a rain event, you've got a bunch of water coming through and the salinity changes. Um, soils will change pretty quickly too. So we've already begun seeing that the soils look like wetland soils in that transition zone. They're often an anaerobic. Uh, they're often very, very wet. But there are live trees in these transects that we're monitoring the health of. Um, so the trees, they respond at a different time scale, which maybe is expected. Maybe they have um, internal processes for handling for some of these stress. Um, so if this is one example. Maybe this crowd probably hasn't looked at sap flow data before. Um, but on the top panel, um, we are looking at water depth in these wells. Um, anything above zero means it was flooded. So you see that red line is often above zero. That's our wetland. And that um, blue line is the transition, which sort of goes between flooded and not flooded. Um, the bottom shows sap flow during the onset of the growth season. And basically what I want to direct your line to, it, or your eye to, is the decreasing trend at the end there, um, and also the decreasing trend in the water level. So as the trees begin to grow, they're taking water up and actually um, potentially resulting in this decrease in groundwater level in that transition site. So the trees are actively taking care of that flood condition that they would otherwise not like. Um, they don't like wet feet, and if their feet stay wet for too long, they're going to die. But in this situation, they're actually maintaining a healthy environment for themselves. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, another phenomenon that we've seen persistently across many, many sites um, is the impact of floods on subsurface oxygen. So we've observed here, and I'm showing one example from Old Woman Creek when that barrier you can see was um, set up is that flood water deliver oxic water to otherwise anoxic subsurface environments. Um, and the variable in inundated places have the biggest response. So you see on the bottom, um, this pulse in dissolved oxygen, and this is oxygen in the groundwater well. 
um, about a meter deep uh, below the surface. So an environment that's almost always anoxic has these moments of about a day when it goes oxic and aerobic can, uh, processes can kick in. I think that's fascinating from a carbon cycle perspective. All of a sudden we can have aerobic respiration happening in these soils um, that totally changes the redox state of what's going on there. Um, a system that was probably creating a lot of methane shifting now back to potentially organic matter consumption. Um, I don't, I'm not going to show data, but we've seen this in our tidal sites where basically during every king tide, you have these pulse events. Um, we've seen them in a state in a field site in Washington um, and estimated that the subsurface was actually oxic anywhere from like 10 to 20% of the year if you factor off these floods. So an environment that you assume is anoxic and stable might not always be. We were curious on um, studying the, the respiration rates involved with these oxic events. So using those exchange samples about um, a subset of about half of them, we inundated them with seawater in the lab. And we saw that the sediment um, collected underlying surface waters and the soils collected from wetlands had a two order of magnitude greater oxygen consumption rate. We've done some other experiments where we pasteurized samples to try to figure out if it's all biotic or abiotic. And we saw that it was about 50, 50. So, Half of the oxygen consumption is from redox um, and the other half is from biology kicking in. Um, I've also, we also looked at greenhouse gas production and obviously the, the, that's, this result's obvious. We saw a decrease in methane production um, when we added seawater to, to these soils and a slight increase in CO2. We did some other experiments. In this case, we added just um, fresh water to a couple sediments collected at Old Woman Creek, a freshwater system at Beaver Creek, a saltwater system. And I thought these results kind of highlighted that, that dependence on electron acceptors really nice. So we're looking at methane production and you can steer your eye to the uh, right hand panel where we did anaerobic incubations. The left hand is aerobic. Um, and note that the scales are different on each of these graphs. This center one is 100,000 ppm or an animal, sorry. And the bottom was only 150. So we saw suppressed uh, methanogenesis when in this experiment on the top. And in that case, we observed a large amount of iron too. So we think that iron reduction is limiting methanogenesis in that case. And it's really interesting because that soil was only collected 100 meters away from the soil that had 100,000 meters produced. Um, so dip subtle differences in soil composition can drive great differences in processes like methanogenesis. The bottom one is your example of a saline soil where uh, we had a bunch of sulfate present and it could never get over sulfate production. Um, if you open the bottle, you can smell sulfur and we have very limited methane production. So this leads me to some exciting results about our big Tempest experiment. Um, but we, the amount of water that we dumped, we calculated, simulated a roughly 15 centimeter rain event, which would be comparable to about a 10 year storm in this system. Um, we saturated the entire rooting zone for, um, for about five hours. And we, the year before this event, um, we had Hurricane Ida hit that site and estimated that the impact of Ida on that particular forest plot was about 40% shorter and also less spatially expansive than these uh, treatments that we applied. So you can see in the gray box on the top, that's soil water content. Um, we've elevated the soil water content to basically saturate the conditions. On the bottom, that's groundwater level. We basically rose the groundwater table up almost near the surface with these treatments. And like I showed earlier, we had um, surface runoff from the plots. Here's a picture showing salinity, soil salinity. Um, so the one on the left, the, the visual is electrical conductivity in the surface soils. And then on the right, those are our groundwater wells where we elevated this groundwater salinity to about three parts per thousand. And the water that we were pumping is from an estuary that was not super salty. It was about, I can't remember on the day, Allison might remember. Um, so here we're looking at um, oxygen concentrations in the control plot, the freshwater plot, and the seawater plot. You can see that we also drove anoxia in the system by saturating it. Um, so we've shifted that system from an aerobic upland forest to an anaerobic, almost wetland-like system in a matter of a day. Here we're looking at um, greenhouse gas impacts. So the top plot is methane uptake, um, and then the bottom is CO2 release from soils. Um, so we shifted the system to a methane source actually during the event that normally takes up a lot of methane. I don't have data here, but I was measuring as well with my colleague Roberta, methane fluxes from the tree. And the trees actually turned to a methane source from a methane uh, sink during the experiment. And then we saw an interesting lag in the CO2 uh, fluxes. CO2 fluxes decreased at first when we flooded the thing. 
And then in the C100 plot, they actually increased after the event. One last piece of data, um, I'm showing some data from Allison and collected pore water concentrations. And this was a sort of lagged event effect we saw where a few months after the event, um, I highlighted in that box, we actually saw increased, substantially increased DOC concentrations in the pore water um, and only in the seawater plot. So we're thinking that this has something to do with um, the ionic composition of the soils that we've created. And you can see a visual of the color of the CDOM coming out um, after the fact versus other times of the year. I think I'm at time, so I might uh, just quickly skip through. Um, this is another plot of sap flow data. And long story short, we saw suppressed um, transpiration from all the trees the next day after the inundation, but they recovered in a few days. So this event was not enough to push them over the edge. Um, as soon as those soils are not saturated, the trees are happy again. Um, so it would take a lot of these. In, I'm going to skip that um, tree data. But basically, we've theorized, I'll, I don't have a conclusion, but I'll end with this um, sort of theoretical model for how ghost forests form. And I've circled in purple the ones that I think are relevant to these discussions of extreme events. Um, but basically, plants need freshwater access. Um, they don't like soil salinity. They don't like soil hypoxia. They don't like being damaged by storms. Um, drought acts very similar to salt stress, actually. Um, and these effects or pre predisposing factors ultimately lead to, lead to a hydraulic failure. So the plant can't use water. Um, and then carbon starvation, they run out of enough carbon store. So I'm going to leave it with that with a bunch of cool pictures of our team. Um, and I want to thank all of the, you know, 60 plus people who contributed to this talk here. Thanks. Um, Marcel Ardon, NC State. Uh, great talk. This is such an exciting project. It's so cool. Um, so I was interested about the methane, because in one slide you showed, you said that we suspected when we add salt, methane goes down. But then when you showed the data from the tempest, methane went up, and that's to read more than the fresh one, right? Yeah, that, I, that same, same thing, confusing. We didn't add that much when talking to this. The salt water we were adding wasn't that saline, so we were about three PSU, so there was maybe enough, not enough sulfate in there to get stuck at that point in the ladder. Um, they maybe quickly used up that sulfate. I guess we could probably we probably measured sulfate from the pore water. Um, I think the difference between those plots is actually a difference in topography. So that plot pooled a little more, um, just based on very subtle differences. It had more pooling around um, where we were measuring fluxes. Uh, so, one more question. Yeah. Sorry. So, is the salt water actually salt water, or salt water just salt? It, it is water that we're pumping from the Road River estuary. And so that estuary is in pure seawater. I, I don't remember what the salinity of the source water was. I think it's like six or something. Um, it could also be new. Oh, or, totally. Yeah. So I mean, that, I think I skipped through that when talking about the CO2. Uh, the fresh water, we're using municipal fresh water that gets trucked in. So it's pretty clean, whereas we have a lot of organisms and whatnot in seawater. <laughs> I think we're going to transition to our next speaker, but we'll have some discussion at the end. Okay. And so our next speaker is Laura Johnson from the Plymouth Marine Lab, and he's going to give us, as I said, a special bonus talk um, about water. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk about a new uh, EVI, so a new in, uh, Earth Venture Initiative that uh, has been funded or is, is being under in process. And the idea here is to build an instrument that will be a geostationary satellite, uh, which means that we, oh, sorry, that didn't work. There we go. Uh, so Glimmer is a geostationary satellite that is, can measure ocean color with very high spatial and temporal resolution. And actually, I'm just gonna go back and do this like this. So what is a high, what is a geostationary satellite? Basically means that it sits in one spot and looks down to the earth at the same place all the time. So a normal satellite is kind of spinning around and you get one image per day or two days and or 16 days, depending on how, how it's set up. But in this case, we can get images uh, where we were standing in the same place all the time. And the idea here is to have a, 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 a very high temporal resolution, but also 
uh, hyperspectral. So the data we we'll get from this instrument would be equivalent to PACE. So we can do whatever algorithms we're developing for PACE, we should be able to use in Glimmer as well. We also have a reasonably high spatial resolution. Sure. Oh, no, this is totally fine. But, you know, I think I was a bit taller than the former speaker. All right. We also have a reasonably high uh, spatial resolution. So we get about 300 meter grid cells. So, so it's not perfect in any way, but it's kind of the Goldilocks of an instrument. So we have high temporal resolution, high spatial resolution compared to what we have right now, and also hyperspectral resolution uh, when we do the measurements. And the area we're going to look at is primarily uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, where we're going to get six images per day. Um, we also have a couple of other areas that we can, can get images. So we have a little bit of a bigger time budget than that. But one thing that's really, really cool is that it's on a two-dimensional gimbal, which means that we can actually, we will be able to, to aim it at different places. So the PI can decide that there is a panel somewhere we can go in and take extra images. So this is this is a very versatile and, and uh, uh, adaptable instrument in that sense. So, so it's primarily the Gulf of Mexico. We can get the images a little bit around the other parts, but we can also get, uh, uh, we, we can have a discussion with scientists if we need more, more data at, at certain area. That's something to think about. And this, this instrument is, is, is planned to launch 2027. So that, that, that's kind of the plan. Um, the project is run out of UNH, and th these are the people that actually do the work. I'm just very far on the side. I'm, I'm just talking about this because I happen to be here. So I'm on the science team, but uh, the, the, the people that should get all the glory is uh, Joe Salisbury and Antonio Menino, who is uh, the, the PI and the deputy PI, and, uh, and they are developing the instrument. And this is done together with, with NASA Goddard, uh, uh, I think Langley, and uh, Raytheon is building the instrument. And we also have uh, 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 Southwest Research is involved with Alpha. So, so it's a kind of a collaborative work. We're really trying to bring people in to work with us and see how this develops. So we're kind of piggybacking on the PACE project when it comes to applications, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have any interest in how we can use this data or thoughts about how you can use this data, talk to us and we, we will see what, that, what, we, what we can use this for, or what you can use it for. Maria Giorgio at uh, at uh, CUNY in New York is the one who's primarily doing the applications work. Uh, and the science that we're talking about that we want that we are most interested in this, this project as, uh, is, is to partly look at short time coastal processes and, so, and, and to understand how high frequency fluxes of things like sediment, organic matters, and materials are affecting the coastal zone. We're also interested in uh, better understanding the, the phytoplankton growth and physiology, especially on diurnal scales. So, so these are the two main things. This is this is primarily or it started as a research project, but so 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 this is what what where we are thinking how we can use this. Um, and some of the problems we can get out here is pretty much the same as, as we were thinking we can get from pay. So on the left side here, we have kind of the typical ocean color project. Um, which is things like chlorophyll and phytoplankton uh, pigments and POC, et cetera. Et cetera. Then on the right side, this is where it gets more complicated, more, but also more interesting, because we are hoping to get better estimates of net primary production, net community production, and just fluxes. Like, like what, is our, what are the ways of changes and, uh, of different products? And also, we want to be able to get different kind of application products, like apps and uh, floating algebra up by now. So the, the, this is something that the science team is working very actively in trying to kind of facilitate both the, the temporal resolution and the spectral resolution for this. I'm just going to show how this can work because so Joe and I have been working on, on, on trying to, to figure out ways of, of, of getting fluxes directed from, from um, uh, satellite data. And one thing we have here that we're going to try to apply with the satellite is, is a Lagrangian framework to estimate bio biologic production. The basic the idea here is that you just take a data point somewhere and you attach it to a, you, so, so you take a velocity field from a, from a model, from any kind of ocean model, then you attach the satellite field to these models. Uh, from, uh, um, 
sorry. You take a velocity field, and then you attach, you just run particles in this, in this model. So you see how these particles are moving around in virtually in this, 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 this satellite field. Then you attach satellite data to these, well, to, to these particles. So you have uh, a way of seeing how, how a values in a satellite uh, field is moving around with velocities. And doing so with one particle is not at all very useful, but we can do that with tons and tons and tons of particles. And doing that, we can start to see uh, see how things are changing direct. We can get direct fluxes. So, so with them, that means that we can do this diurnally, and we can also use high-resolution physical ocean models to start to see how where where we have these particles, where, where we have uh, extra flux, and estimate that directly. Um, and we just did it earlier on data data in the Gulf of, uh, in the, the California current. And what we can do that is we can get these very high resolution estimates of fluxes. So this is just changes in, in, um, in chlorophyll where it's red and decreases in chlorophyll, increases in chlorophyll was red and decreases in chlorophyll was blue. So you can see we can start to get this very high resolution uh, variability in time and space. That gives us an ability to start to see where we have uh, rapid changes and also episodic changes. So we think that this combination of physical modeling and satellite images is a really good way to start to, to pick up episodic events and try to understand better what is driving those episodic events. So I'm going to stop here, but uh, if you have any thought, uh, questions or, or interest in the Glimmer product, please, please get in touch with, with Either me or the, the rest of the science team, or especially Joe Salisbury, who is the, the PI. Joe is also very well acquainted in this and, and knows probably more than me about, especially at applications. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite all three of our speakers to come back up onto the stage for a discussion. Maybe if there were questions or to before or Acquiring us from Hi, Ariana Sutton, we are USGS. Um, I have no idea if the, what my answer is going to be here, but so I'm curious can this new Glimmer product also help us get at seagrasses or is it just the surface water? Seagrasses, yeah, well, so, so in our we will probably see that to, to about the first half of that. So we should be able to see the secret per se. The problem we have is that, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, the problem we have is the spatial resolution is about 300 meters. So that's what could be the, the limiting factor. On the other, also, secret does not tend to not move so much. So maybe the dynamics of them might not be uh, primary use. I can see really interesting things where you could do that, like the morning was had to do. And if the, the spatial resolution is fine, yes, you, you can work on that. Uh, normally, people are using things like that or, or Sentinel 2 for those, those kind of applications because there we get down to meter, 10 meter resolutions. But, but in principle, yes, you could use that. I have a really quick question. Um, when you listed the overpasses, was that a six times the end of and two times the end of? Or, yeah. Or yeah. So, so, so we, we, we start with those six times. In the Gulf of Mexico, but then the other, uh, the, the other, the other overpasses or the other images are extra time budget that we, we have added into the to the uh, project. Um, and of course, in the winter we're going to have fewer images, and some are going to have more images. But in the winter, we might actually be able to get uh, more images in the southern uh, hemisphere as well. Winter ECU. So if I understand this right, you've got a stationary object in space, and so reasonable clouds move aside, and you can then get an image once a cloud moves aside. How do you deal with a object of a huge hurricane or cyclonic cell which doesn't move for five days? Are you really advancing the times of what's going on underneath that large cloud or that hurricane system? Uh, Probably so. So our case is one of the things that we want to look at, of course. Uh, yes and no. We're not going to be able to say more than anything we have right now. 
uh, during the storm. And that is mainly because we already have your stationary satellites flying that can do the cloud structures, et cetera, et cetera, we go with the storm. But afterwards, we can be, we're able to see how the, 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 the for example, an ecosystem is responding much, in much, much higher temporal details. So we can see, we, so, so me personally, I'm more interested in what's happening after the during the storm from a scientific viewpoint. And, and, and fluxes from rivers can resolve much higher detail in, in time and hopefully also in space. So there is, there is another uh, uh, platform, also that's fine, that has 300 million resolution. So, so we're never best, but, but we think that this combination is, is a great, is, is a great, great uh, compromise between different uh, strategies. But, but yes, it's, it's after uh, the, the hurricane more than during the hurricane. Thanks for uh, all the talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I have a question for Nick. So um, when you talked about you know, how you were creating models mechanistically for um, the, the K-based and uh, aqua, aqua, wind. aqua wind. Yes. If you could talk a little bit more about those and how going about that, some of the inputs that were important. Yeah. Great. <laughs> you asked the uh, empiricist about the model. Uh, so the, the, the one I know more about is uh, the key base framework. So basically, we're taking high res organic matter composition. So basically, the spectra you get off the FGICRS. And that program has developed ways I don't know how, but where there's basically user pipelines where the user can go onto their web page and upload data and it spits you back reaction networks. It's still a work in progress, but basically, my understanding is that it's telling you from these spectra the top 10 theoretical structures, and then you could attribute uh, some rate kinetics to those top 10 molecular structures, or formula, sorry, not structure. Um, so it, that, there's still a lot of work to be done in, in that, with that pipeline. Um, and then basically, you're feeding that to something like P Flowtrend or Aquaman. Uh, and Aquamend is basically using reactions from free, free QC. Um, it, you can put whatever reactions you want in there. Um, if you want to keep it simple, you could just have antigenesis. And if you want to get fancy, you put in all the redox reactions and whatnot. And I guess that we usually use those for trying to then, okay, I did an experiment. Let's tune a model so it can replicate my experiment. And then I can test a hypothesis with the model uh, where. I, I can show you that I've looked at and validate with these experimental results that this model works, this setup. Now, what happens if we change the pH? What happens if we do this? Um, so it's sort of a hypothesis driven modeling framework, I guess. But those reactions can be put into figure scale spatially models. And with the software being closed, where's the going to get back to the company? No, no, it's there. So every, I think every model I put up there is open source. So KBase is run from Argonne National Lab. Um, it's a, basically a DOE user facility in a sense. And, uh, I think MEN is also open source and launcher. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's all on you. So I'm going to ask a question as a biologist. I think of temperature as a master regulator. So how do you think about temperature changes, global change in your systems that you're studying, either experimentally or observations? Sorry, was that from you? It's both of you, I think. Yeah. That, that is one of the motivations behind in training these observational data to models, that if we trust our model, we can simulate patterns if we get to warmer. Uh, I didn't show results from one of the our plant models where basically you're, you're feeding it higher CO2, you're feeding it more temperature and seeing what the competing influence of those two are, for example. Uh, we've also done some, well, we've done some lab experiments at different temperatures, but I should mention that just downhill from our Tempest experiment is the Global Change Research Equipment, where they've been manipulating temperature and CO2 for the last like, 40 years on these questions. Experimentally, do you have any comments? <laughs> I don't. Now, all I can tell you is the temperature is very important uh, from a seasonal perspective as well. Uh, and this is one of the uh, issues with uh, harmful outbreaks, particularly cyanobacteria. 
that uh, track the temperature and changes the temperature really uh, well. If there's one, there's one parameter that you can throw in there to look at cyanobacterial boundaries, uh, it's off of temperature. So, big deal. That is if you have enough nutrients to begin with. Signature again, I have a holistic comment and a big picture question um, for Nick. Uh, the experiment is amazing, it seems amazing. I'm just wondering who is in charge of making sure like the whole enterprise is functioning smoothly. Is that your job, basically? No, I didn't do a good job of calling up the names on the uh, talk. So the, the experiment, I didn't even mention where it's housed, is at the on the campus of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Um, and it's like I just mentioned, up, uphill from this other long term experiment they've been doing. So Pat McGonagall is the chief scientist of the project. Um, they physically own the land. So setting up such an experiment, you need a favorable landowner. It just so happens he's the chief scientist. Um, and he has a team of probably 10, um, one who's a postdoc who basically led the design and the, the build out. We've worked with a small company called Global Aquatic Research, uh, led by Rick and Stella Smith, who did the engineering. Uh, but yeah, we've got the crew on site. And it's, it's a beast to maintain. Um, and then, uh, question about Glimmery. What is the target first user? Uh, what's the first set of, um, you know, what's the first trial going to be on? Or is it going to be open to the public immediately once it's uh, available? As soon as we uh, get, we, as soon as we know the data is good, yes, it will be open for everyone. We are using the same uh, processing chain as uh, as the other uh, assets that are buying right now, so not just uh, beers uh, um, that basically to be. So, so this is going to come out of 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 of, uh, out of Goddard. The same way as you're getting the data for for current ocean color data, so that's that's going to be nice. That means that we don't have to build new tools or anything like that. We do want to have so. So one thing I'm interested in is trying to think about how we can develop new methods, develop new uh, algorithms, and, and look at such a near shore uh, systems in a in a collaborative way because. It tends to be that that we in the U.S. or you in the U.S. I suppose since I'm in England right now are a little bit more blue water focused than what, what Europe is. So so in Europe people are doing thinking a little bit more of estuary work and near coastal work when it comes to ocean color, um, and therefore we are using, for example, just one chlorophyll algorithm here in the U.S. Normally, when we do the standard process, where in the Europe, they have a little bit of other strategy. And that is something to think about. So so, so we need to have, uh, so, so we, 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 we really want to work with near shore people. We want to really want to work with people that are, are, are interested in specific regions in that way. Uh, and that's how to become directed. That might mean that we have to develop new algorithms that we need to have uh, other processing chains, et cetera, et cetera, for that. But that's so, so that's not going to be on the shelf right away. But 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 the, the standard products will be. So so but if you don't fit into that little pigeonhole that we have right now, come in and talk to us and see what we can do. Hi, Ariana Secretary USGS. Um, I think this is mostly a question for Nick, but I'm happy to hear from other people too. Um, so when in sort of a management and policy framework, we're really interested in carbon accounting and we're looking at natural climate solutions, um, it, you know, one of the things we have to factor in is that there is natural variability and extreme events are clearly one of those drivers. So I'm wondering if anything coming out of the compass work so far would help us to better estimate how much extra we need to account for in natural systems, knowing that at times we won't hit our goals and it, and we might even go backwards a little with these extreme events. So is it is it you know we need double as much to be able to count? Or I don't know if Compass has anything on that yet, but I was curious. We we haven't focused a lot on burial, but more on fluxes, so like greenhouse gas fluxes. I think just a general comment, Compass aside, is that. It, when we account for blue carbon, we're missing two big things with the vertical and lateral fluxes. So I think until we have those down, 
we're not going to be able to assign a value to a piece of carbon in the soil. Um, in terms of the lateral transport, that could actually augment what we think is being buried if we're pulsing out alkalinity, uh, or maybe we're pulsing out re reactive stuff that just goes back to C2 that's recycled. Uh, so I think the lateral transport needs to be nailed down. There was some paper that showed it could be 50% of it. This is the production is being exported. And if that's alkalinity, it's a good thing. If it's not, then it's just recycling. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I have anything to say from the compass perspective for today. Uh, John Kamanowski, Florida International University. I have a question for both Roar and uh, Hans. Maybe if you could kind of think about it together. Just seeing the really uh, impressive time series of Glimmer and then thinking about Hans' time series and painstaking efforts to get out to the field to collect those samples for DOM, DOC. Um, how could we begin to use a high res tool like Glimmer to reinform our long term monitoring efforts in, in, in time and space? I think that just in a very general sense, one of the problems we have in uh, when we're looking at rare events, we all, everyone hears we are all talking about extreme events, right? but normally when I think about it, I think about episodic events because you can have rare events that are very far. Uh, uh, that important for a system that we don't that it doesn't have to come from a storm. It can come from a combination of benign small effects, but but you have a perfect storm. Well, that was a bad. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. But but you get the, the perfect connection, and you get the bloom. You can, you you see that in the open ocean as well. And I think that the one way of looking at this, where where the long time series are extremely important, is. To look at the statistical distribution of, of how often these events are, have happened, we can do with something with, with, with Glimmer when we with this up and uh, flying, is that we can start to see what, how the spatial distribution of those statistical, the, the spatial distribution of the statistical distribution here. We might not be able to pick up, because with the, the problem with the time series, you can only see it at one point. And, and if you go and look at the chlorophyll data set, there's about 25 years now. There are areas where you might have one extreme bloom that you picked up once. And that happened other places probably as well, but, but it was cloudy and so on because it's so rare. And so 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 you can you can you can you can do it in two ways then. I think that temporal temporal spatial combination of data where you have one high resolution data set that have, or spatially just, uh, well uh, resolved data set that can tell us something about a year or two years. Combined with the long time series that can give us much more of an understanding of the rareness of something in one point is where you can start to, to understand. Because without it, it's much, much harder to know what is normal. There is, there is this, this uh, in, in, interesting apology. There's this thing about uh, snow owls, it's my favorite example. You, you know, the, the lemmings, are, the, like you have lemming years of the Arctic, and then you have these extreme pulses of snow owls the next year or the same year. It's like this mystery. Because it's like the, the snow owl uh, 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 population is, is, is boom and busting with the with the the the, the, the lemmings, and then okay, this is textbook stuff until they realize they start taggers uh, trackers on the snow owls and realize it was just one population that was like looking for the lemmings. So then the snow owl population is super stable. It's just that you in a place they just show up and they have tons and tons of snow owls and then they disappear. You think that that is a local phenomenon. But no, it's just this like, like large scale population. And that's something to be really careful about when we're thinking about these processes. Yeah, one of the things that excites me about your program is the hyperspectral capability, because that can tell us a lot about bloom phenomena and how blooms are set up and who's doing it, who's responsible. You know, we, uh, as part of the ModMod program, we do. Uh, Diagnostic photopigment analysis, different algal groups. And while that doesn't tell you what the species are, uh, you know, if you know enough about the estuary uh, and you get a signal for dinoflagellates, you have a pretty good idea uh, of whether or not you need to, you know, caution the public uh, or assign back to groups, for example. So that's one thing we've been waiting for the folks out there in the field is to be able to. Uh, relate or correlate hyperspectral imagery to what we're seeing in terms of phenomena. 
And these balloons can change uh, quite rapidly, uh, even on an hourly scale, depending on uh, wind mixing and uh, you know advective processes and things like that. So, so that's that's something we would be excited about from having that uh, sensor sitting above Panamco Sound. We're very close to other city Yeah, and. Uh, one of the reasons I brought up this kind of weird disjointed uh, component or the, the combination of, of satellite data and, and physical process, physical models, is that this is something we've talked about internally. This is work that kind of led to Joe being very interested in writing the proposal for Libra as well. And what we are trying to get into, and I think it's really important in a community like this, is to think about upstream processes because it's very easy to look at some place and think about how that is affected by. Everything. But, but everything is coming from somewhere else. And when we start to do these result, result, uh, we start to resolve these kind of time scales, that, that especially because that becomes almost more important. And so, so we're going to need really good physical models because, as I say, the direction is it can be really important even on hours. And and how to think about what we're seeing in a, in a near coastal area, how is that connected to like where were the conditions that created what we see? That, that's always a, a big challenge. And what are the kinetics and what are the temporal time scales of these, these processes? Because we are, it's a very hard problem to solve because we, could, we can do it in it by geochemical models, but we could make tons of assumptions. And those assumptions are going to give us a result. So, so how do we get away from that, that kind of, 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 of self spiral of doubt and, and misery that I always end up doing when I think about this? And I think that is one way to do it, like really good physical models and then try to, to understand where things are coming. Okay, folks. Um, so welcome to our afternoon report out and thinking about what to do for tomorrow. Um, Joey's gonna help uh, pass the mic around as we do our report out here. And just checking our checking our levels. Looks like it's, can we can, be heard out there in Zoomland, so that's great. All right, so like we did yesterday, we're gonna go around and if you can just summarize the top uh, three to five things that you talked about today uh, in your breakouts related to the prompts, and then we'll hear from each of our six groups. And then after that, we'll start thinking about what we're gonna do for breakouts tomorrow. Okay. So where is, uh, Who's going to report out for group one? All right. Okay. Um, Dana? Name, rank, and serial number. Dana Hunt, taking mercy. So, reporting out for group one. So, we talked a lot about how to identify appropriate locations. We focused on identifying a representative reference system that were logistically easy to study. Um, and then also, using this to develop a network of satellite locations to expand the geographic and perimeter space for each of the studies to kind of answer very specific questions. I'm inspired by our compass talk this morning. We also talked about distributed manipulative experiments to understand mechanisms and biogeochemical processes. So those were inspired by crowdsourced experiments. Maybe we developed a kit that could be sent out um, that could be targeted. So if you knew there was a hurricane heading towards Florida, we send it out to a network of 30 people across Florida and they apply the samples in a standardized way. And finally, we talked about being strategic about collaboration, getting too big too early. We talked about the value of involving social scientists and public policy, but maybe it was too soon to kind of expand that far out of our scientific realm. We needed to be careful. Great, thank you. Oh, um, That's I'm easy. Austin Myers Fig. Uh, I'm with my partner for two at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, you can't see me in the plays and we can put on the So we talked about the ground that we use today. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that we, we sort of focused in on was the service and novelty of the science questions that we were asking. And so um, there was a really awesome sort of framework for that that I tried to capture that um that our group had talked about. And it's basically like, okay. Thinking of a science question, how do extreme events short circuit or supercharge the carbon cycle? Um, and so, to in order to like address that overarching question, you know, we, we need to be fully coordinated and compiled. We need to get um, you know 
Sampling arrays, existing infrastructure, and cohesive remote sensing and rapid modeling predictions have sort of all together. So we need to do everything, which is, you know, makes it hard, right? Um, and so we really decided to focus in on like a single region maybe to start out with because if we need to do everything, we can't do it everywhere, right? Um, and so we talked a lot about different regions and, and sort of pros and cons of different regions. And so we sort of landed on the mid latitude um, region, sort of right where we're at. Um, and, and really thinking about a region of coastal carbon storage and transformations that also has a human aspect uh, to it. Um, and then finally, we talked about people who are using the tools and information, including them in the conversation as well, because ultimately, if we do the cool science, somebody hopefully will be able to use that uh, to inform decision making. So I think that's everything that we talked about. Great, thanks. Great. 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 And so <laughs> Elliot White, the same university before we the three. So we talked about what are the ideals for modeling. A critical component was we need more fine scale data for terrestrial components. So the oceanic stuff, the satellite remote sensing, we can do those things very well. But on uh, terrestrial component, there's a lot of variation over short distances, and spatial satellite remote sensing are kind of unable to resolve some of those, some of those sometimes. Uh, in addition to that, we also talk about the role of both hydrologic regime and air as connectors. So making sure that we're measuring those components in addition to the things that we're actually out there studying, studying so that we can connect across different gradients and landscapes. Uh, thinking about an ideal system or uh, kind of great places to do it, we spent a lot of time talking about contrasting systems. So San Francisco Bay, which has a lot of genetic manipulation and control. And you think about kind of the site on the East Coast of Albemarle, Pamlico, where there's maybe less anthropogenic uh, manipulation. And then also in that, looking at sites that have difference in tidal variation. Uh, and kind of the conversation and thinking about sites, we thought about the selection bias that goes in. Uh, oftentimes we want to have something that's accessible. So then we're only going to places that are accessible. What are we missing by going to places that aren't accessible? And so with that, uh, the idea of drones came up, some ferries like. I was talking about earlier. So finding unconventional ways to sample in places that you know we get information from. And thinking about manipulative experiments, we actually realized we spent a lot of time talking about things that uh, were not designed to be experiments or kind of accidental. So dams being removed and oh, now we have a whole new experiment set up. But we did some spend some time thinking about things that humans are doing. So uh, people are considering using hydrogen peroxide for algal bloom. So with the, the consequences of stuff like that. And then finally, on the who's missing component, so trophic connections, looking at food webs and how that may be an important component, science communicators, and then also uh, giving back to the role of water as a connector, landscape hydrologists and groundwater hydrologists. Thanks. Uh, I'm hey, Eric Bean, University of Nevada, Reno, and I'm reporting for Group 4. Uh, so we talked about how our current understanding of processes is often based on probability distributions or averages. Um, and if we want to be able to manage or prepare for extreme events, but we're basing our understanding on averages that could potentially be problematic or disastrous. And so we really need to do a better job of understanding things that occur at the tails of the distribution. Um, this is really challenging to do because extreme events are, are relatively rare. Um, and so we talked about bringing in paleo experts who um, can look far enough into the past that there might be some analogies to things that we might expect in the future. Um, we also talked about you know, positive and negative feedback. So extreme events don't happen as much. They can influence one another and either amplify or dampen one another's effects. Um, yeah, so. Bye. I am Kelsey Vincent I'm from Oregon State University. And we started our discussion thinking about how the question, how we could find model locations for a seesaw. Maybe accidentally or implicitly when we first thought of it meant what is an ideal location where can the board we decide on Earth where we should go. And actually really reject that idea based on the course of variability and where you can plan for extreme events. So 
we talked a lot about how it would be really, really good to first define within this group or in activities that happen after this workshop, a set of central questions that link terrestrial um, processes to marine processes, and then kind of create a um, science traceability matrix, which just essentially would ask for each question, what um, products do we need to have measured? On what time scales do they give us information? And then where on earth do we have existing time series sites and a number of data that may have been collected for a totally different reason, but really could be useful for us to begin to piece together um, the face space of what we're talking about with extreme events, both for wildfires and for storms. So we also talked about how we are in the room missing um, social scientists and stakeholders and indigenous knowledge. In, in our group's view, we didn't think it was too soon necessarily to bring in those people, but that with a conference of this size, it maybe would be the most productive. And so it's suggesting that perhaps in future conferences, we could have smaller workshops that are maybe 20 people, 30 people, and bring in an outside facilitator whose specialty is to help um, enable conversations across different groups of different backgrounds. So that early in the conversation, people, um, their needs, their interests, and you know, societal applications can be really fully met by the community. And maybe in some instances, drive some of the science questions. Um, we also talked about how the UN Ocean Decade is currently this decade that we're in, and we don't have a lot of um, international collaborations at present. So we could seek to form a group that could be officially endorsed under the UN Decade. And I, yeah, if anyone has anything to add from our group, my notes are in my um, chair, so I don't, I might be forgetting. Yeah, Thanks. And, All right, and I'm uh, group six. Um, so, for locations, we kind of separated uh, storms and fires a bit. Um, we talked about, we identified the Mid-Atlantic um, and the Gulf of Mexico as our, our two top candidates um, and looked at the pros and cons uh, in both. They both have uh, very good observation and modeling resources. Um, one thing that maybe the Gulf of Mexico had over the Mid-Atlantic fight is that uh, if there is uh, one of the system that where the carbon is more susceptible to perturbation, um, that would be the Gulf of Mexico, um, again, because of the statistic of uh, marsh loss there. Um, so getting into the um, coastal or the control studies, um, we uh, kind of considered the talk today and what a, a great example that was. Um, we kind of considered how to extend that to other uh, coastal environmental settings um, that weren't yet represented um, by uh, such a large scale and comprehensive study um, and how we might kind of uh, assess uh, anything that might still be missed in, in areas we might target where we could go back to smaller scale um, studies with more variables and treatment levels. Um, and then we could identify and scale master variables from those up to the meso scale. Um, Again, I think this has been echoed in a number of other um, points made uh, in terms of collaboration. Uh, don't get too big too fast. Uh, we, we had said it's keep it small, doable, and kind of build out incrementally. Um, a few things that we identified that would be good to do now were consider data management, integration, availability, QA, and just start considering the, the, the data perspective. Um, and then also a good uh, thing to have now that we really haven't discussed too much is an outward facing website and resource for both outreach, stakeholders, potential partners, um, internal management like guidelines and resources for that, um, that uh, integration. Okay, great. Thanks everybody, that was uh, really nice. Yeah. All right, I'm going to read what Sasha and I think she had one or two other people join. Um, so, Okay, point number one, location can be challenging during any extreme event as these events may threaten human safety and livelihood, difficult to mobilize for sampling, you can't reasonably sample safely. Fires may restrict access to ships or piers or other monitoring. Also, from Trishita, who joined on Zoom, near coastal regions of the Indian subcontinent are very relevant for cyclones, but ship-based measurements would be hazardous during storms, so moorings are a good option. Measurements of the following variables are very useful, ECO2, POC, nutrient concentrations. 
Need more monitoring, no instruments in the Arabian Sea that are measuring PCO2. Second, it seems important for people working on carbon dioxide removal initiatives and monitoring, reporting, and verification to think about the impact of extreme events on their proposed carbon sequestration projects and programs. How do these events remobilize carbon that was once considered sequestered? What are the timescales of these events? And how do the aftershocks impact the ability of the ecosystem to sequester carbon going forward? Finally, three, this morning, Hans mentioned taking advantage of new hyperspectral sensors to help with monitoring after storms or fires, and he brought up a really important point about knowing your system. With the current state of the science, I don't think we'll be able to say that the same signal means the same thing across ecosystems and watersheds. One way to speed up the process of understanding satellite data in your system, whether it be estuary, coastal ocean, etc., is to integrate in situ hyperspectral reflectance measurements into existing coastal monitoring programs and observations. If you can show existing relationships in your system between, for instance, bloom phenology and ocean color, it will be easier to develop models and take advantage of hyperspectral remote sensing data when they exist. But if you can't say whether the signal you're seeing is due to increased sediment transport, or a dinoflagellate bloom, those measurements will not help your understanding of the ecosystem response. Um, yes. Okay, so Simone had made Simone made a comment for extreme events on open waters, sail drones have proven to be capable of withstanding hurricanes and the Southern Ocean. Does it make sense to call for broader use of that sort of autonomous instrumentation? Great. Um, so we have heard a lot of uh, great feedback and I think a lot of common themes. And so what I was trying to do here was to just start uh, thinking about tomorrow. So tomorrow's aim is to for us to come up with these next steps. What are they going to be and how are we as the key members here going to start organizing ourselves to meet these objectives and achieve uh, and make and take these next steps. So I'm happy to say what I think are three possible groups that we could break into and then we could discuss that um, and at least take that step forward. So what I heard today is that we have a lot of existing data ourselves we know about existing data networks. We know about all different types of sensors from sail drones all the way to uh, you know, everything else that we've discussed. So it seems to me that one group might be a group that works on putting together what are the available data relative to what we want. That, so who wants to jump into that one? Um, you know, and, I think too, part of what we're doing is trying to find out what expertise are we lacking? I'm not a data scientist. Um, so I would think that for that type of analysis and, and then getting products out of it, we might need to reach out to our colleagues and networks and find out where we can add in expertise that we don't have. So that's one. What are the data that are existing? What are things that we can draw on, build to, replicate in other uh, systems. And I think having an understanding of that will help us start addressing these questions that we heard a similar thing, but we were talking about in our group, like, okay, what is the, what is the, why do we have no response after one event, uh, but a similar event comes through and there is a huge response or vice versa. And so in order to try to get at that understanding, I think we need to be able to have the data that can uh, inform those types of questions. Second group that uh, I, I uh, came up with was an observational programs group. So relatedly, what kind of programs uh, are out there that we could build on? So not just the data, but the, the programs and what are they doing? We heard a lot about uh, Compass and Exchange this morning, which I think are fantastic models for, for what we could build on, ModMod as well. Uh, so a group that might be um, interested in working on the observational programs and figuring out what things 
we could connect to. So just again, with my NC focus, I'll say that, you know, Modbon uh, would be a good connection to say the coastal pioneer array, this uh, coastal ocean observing system that's going to be moved off the of Virginia and the Carolinas. So trying to find these types of cross connections that'll help us answer those questions, build out that data, uh, and, and begin to better define what the, the seesaw is. Um, a third group is a communications group. So by that, I mean, okay, we need to start communicating what we're producing here. So a communications group could be several subgroups, one that might be interested in trying to help us build some kind of uh, internet, you know, web presence with the website is, or a website has been recommended, um, as well as at, be a place where there can be a clearinghouse. So folks that want to contribute data, so we can begin doing some science uh, as is practical. Uh, we could take steps that way. But the communication group might also be that uh, topic room where folks that want to work on um, summary papers or position and perspective papers uh, can begin organizing. So I'll stop with that and then open up the floor to questions, comments, criticisms. Considering uh, the first uh, comment you did about data, uh, uh, in the European Space Agency, there are kind of a category of projects where, where basically you're getting money to do a little bit of research, but most of the, the, the work you're putting in is actually to do that kind of data aggregation. So trying to figure out what data is, you, you, you synthesize it and you make sure it's available, open source. So I wonder if that would be something we could do, because if we could get a tech for three to six months to, to sit down and do it, but it's tech salary for three to six months to do that. They can, you can get really, really far with, with, with something like a small proposal. So either it's, if NSF would be willing to fund that or, or if it would be possible to do it through NASA, NASA, I think that could be extremely useful because just what one thing we notice is that, that, that if you have, if each group have to go through the databases, try to figure out the data, try to figure out what the, how the data is structured and, and different com conventions and so on, it, it, it's a lot of, of overhead and extra work that, that, that is unnecessary that, that to redo constantly. So, so having a CSV file rather than, than the database, access to the database at OCB, sorry, Heather, but is, is actually much, much more useful. Uh, so, so that's something to think about. We could to write that kind of small proposal. It doesn't have to be big and it's not science safe, but it would really help everyone to, to push forward. Uh, that sounds great, and I think if there are if there are models of uh, folks and they've been involved with those types of activities, that would, it would be great to hear some perspective on that. I don't know if anybody has just kind of building off Roar's idea. If anybody has uh, anything to share, well, one thing that Heather mentioned yesterday was that, that it's, it's one of those things that's it's critical but not very sexy, and so it's always hard to to fund. So um, again, maybe thinking about uh ways to stress its importance uh, or make it more sexy or something you know just uh uh because i think that's that's across nsf and funding agencies they want big ideas and game changers and everything else when this much less effort to go making having much more impact by or better you know focus on data yeah. and i mean it's worth to just check with the program managers what they say yeah absolutely I think another thing along this line and, and these probably these ideas and as we discuss them, they're going to cross groups and boundaries um, is make, so making that connection. We've heard a couple of times about how we at least need to begin preparing and thinking about bringing in the societal relevance and really uh, susceptible populations to where these events occur and, and the effects of them. In thinking about that, I don't know if it's maybe something that the, would it be an aspect of the data analysis that you're talking about as a, as a, as a product. Um, but 
certainly in the communications group, would be trying to reach out uh, to Sea Grants and other types of opportunities and more extension-based uh, organizations, even state agencies, environmental quality, that sort of thing. I think we we want to be um, I think we want to be very broad in where we look for resources, especially uh, as was pointed out, how we don't need to tackle this as one. 64 strong effort all moving in the same uh, direction at the same time. But if we uh, have multiple different activities, there could be smaller groups that uh, could target some of these sort of specialized um, or specialized programs or, uh, you know, uh, different agencies at different levels. Um, when you're speaking, it just reminded me, um, uh, this is born since I left the US, so I'm not familiar with it, but the, the coasts and people um, uh, funding, is it, would there be any application for that? I am not familiar, just the name seemed to fit to some extent. Uh, I'm just familiar enough to be dangerous and probably perhaps misinform many people, but if anyone else is more uh, familiar with it, please uh, chime in. Dana? <laughs> So I'm not an expert, but I'm involved in a uh, coast of people RCN based here in North Carolina. Um, so I think there's a very, just to give some perspective, there's a very heavy emphasis on integration of social science, public health, and work with marginalized groups that are not normally incorporated into science compared to where we are today. So if someone's thinking about that, they, um, you can look at what's been funded, a large scale and uh, uh, small scale hubs, I guess is what they're calling, and it's not clear they're going to have more calls until we heard from the program manager. So and there may not be, it may change, I guess, in the future. But I think there's definitely a heavy emphasis on social science, integration, career development, and infrastructure that isn't currently present. So, not to discourage anyone, but just to uh, think along those lines. So, so I have a question. It's been a great workshop, but the code program um, made me think of the, the following question, which is who are who are the stakeholders of this enterprise we're going to take on? Who are we looking to benefit other than ourselves and finding out what data are out there? Uh, we can predict and, and the reason i say that is not to be cynical but to say perhaps figuring that out gives us a way to figure out you know, what the next steps are um that are of practical value yeah i can i can think of a couple of things we talked about today um and if i could put my group on the spot i don't re i know we we touched on these topics quite a bit but i don't remember all of the exact details the theme of this, though, relates back to, I think, what Hans was showing today. And, and you even shared an anecdote, and maybe you'll, you'll expand on that a little bit more. But a lot of what we're doing affects, um, say, what happens when you flood an area uh, of the you know, populated coastline. Just water quality and trophodynamics and the, all of these sort of related things that aren't necessarily a carbon focus, but certainly are part of what happens when you surge carbon and nutrients into uh, into ecosystems based on storms or you um, eliminate forest cover because of a fire. So I think taking that type of emergency management, uh, ecosystem management, resilience and recovery perspective might be a way to uh, identify the stakeholders and at least say, hey, this is what we're interested in this science. But this really connects, you know, NCC grant, Louisiana Sea Grant, wherever, to issues that you're, you're, you know, you're dealing with as well. So that's where I'm trying to also advocate to reach out to places where we might not think would really be care, caring about carbon cycling and, uh, you know, extreme events. Hans. Yeah, you sort of, you sort of put the words out of my mouth about you too. too. I think, you know, too, I think there are 
there are really good possibilities out there in terms of funding, you know, the kinds of things we talked about. But we need to to show how this is going to benefit society. And and I think that, you know, given the expertise that's here and the problems and the issues that we face, particularly in this state, for example, people that have rebuilt in flood zones. Uh, so Greenville, right? Flood area. Um, it, it has to be put forward in a positive way, in a, in a way that we don't just look like a bunch of whining scientists wanting to know something for our own benefit. So I think um, the more we can think about how this could serve uh, the public as a whole and, um, and lead to uh, mitigation strategies, you know, things like that, um, the better off we're going to be and the better off we'll be in terms of um, having something like this funded, uh, you know, or whatever is going to come out of this. So I think, you know, I'd like everybody to think of it that way and we'll come up hopefully with some novel ideas about how to translate what we are trying to figure out and interested in uh, what, the, what the societal benefits are. Yeah, and it really sounds like the communication group is going to play a major role in that, um, it, whether it's a perspective paper. Uh, one of the, uh, the products we're thinking about is an article um, for EOS. And getting it out there, getting the ideas out there, having a face that people can go see, uh, you know, a website, um, and really having this sort of take form, I think that's, a, that's going to be a critical first step to doing exactly what you said. So the, recently there was a meeting that was organized by uh, Congressman Murphy uh, in our district, all about uh, coastal uh, issues and uh, uh, resilience and things like that. And I so zoomed in on that meeting, but it was basically a bunch of regulators patting each other on the back with all the great stuff they're doing but no, no issues or problems were really solved. And I think that that's the kind of thing that we need to um, what, um, link to in a positive way with uh, not only questions, but answers. You know, but they don't have to be immediate answers, but you know, uh, we've talked about a lot of issues that would require mitigation strategies, for example. Uh, look at weapons, it's a good example. So I think that's where we need to think in terms of uh, something novel that would be uh, funded that we could, you know, explore the seesaw and the connection and the continual concept between the uh, watershed and, and the coast and the coast. Yeah, great. This is bringing me right back to especially the communications group, thinking about the UN decade, like really high level feedback that we can give, like beyond, you know, when we can connect what we're doing to pretty much, I'd say the majority of the sustainable development goals, I think that's, that's saying something. When we can provide input to the Ocean Climate Action Plan on what this community needs, that's saying something. Um, thinking along the lines of things like congressional briefs, you know, like a FAQ one pager about extreme events. You know, coastal hazards is a big focus in a lot of agencies right now. It's not. It's not a stretch for us to to think about these kinds of products. And I, I think that we've had enough conversations here to be able to say a, a couple of things about this. I had a, it's not a stretch words in my mouth as well. Um, I just got back from an O20 like precursor meeting. And again, it was, it's, 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 it's on, on the topic everywhere. And um, at CSR, we just produced, uh, it's a decadal report on megatrends. And one of the seven was that is extreme events mitigating it. And that's not just science, it's everything. So it's on the international stage as well. 
there's also, a, I would say, in addition to, well, as part of the societal benefits, there's an economic uh, role here too. Incentive, yes, there's an economic incentive uh, to be re have a resilient coastal system, uh, to be resilient against all uh, extreme events in general. But there's also, I think, uh, a push we could make for economic opportunities. And this was, how was this cast? As, it was yesterday, I believe, uh, Blake Schaefer mentioned it, and he was talking about the SBIR program. And the idea there is that let's say we sit, we do our work and we say, we need to be able to measure this, whatever this is, but we can't. So, but it's going to be critical to the science and it's going to have all of these outcomes if we can measure it reliably and perhaps cheaply and sustainably. So go to industry to, you know, to tech uh, and, and, this, and say, okay, SBIR program. Can we get this sort of thing funded? Can we, you know, partner with companies that will make the widget that will give us what we need to have? So I'd like to also throw that idea out there as just another part of this, um, you know, that we could that we could build into it, that type of op research and economic opportunity. And that would build into the new tip directory, probably. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, TIP is an, a new NSF program. Technology, uh, innovation, and partnership. Technology, innovation, and partnership. And so it might be worthwhile communicating with those folks uh, to, to mention that. The, the most, uh, a recent um, NSF oceanography newsletter uh, made TIP very prominent. What directory is that? It's its own directory. It's its own. Good. That, that's good because uh, you, you know having a having a new director is a really good good idea as far as approaching them because a lot of the old ones they already have kind of their set you know mindset on things. So uh, Marcel, I don't want to say so. I, I'm sorry if this is changing the subject, but I, maybe to your point and, and thinking about their communication. Because I think of the Boston because of the, these last two days, and this might be my weapon bias, but we know extreme events are increasing, right? Magnitude, frequency, whatever it is. But over and over, we heard there's this loss of carbon, right? Whether it's going to the ocean or being broken down again. So for an EOS article, could we ask the question that as ecosystems lose carbon, they become less resilient? Absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a fantastic point. That's a fantastic point. And in the, uh, you know, discussions about that led up to the, the seesaw concept, it was that, that was that buildup. What happens if you have these successive events? Does the landscape start losing carbon and nutrients that it can, you know, later supply? But you've also taken it into another, you know, into another direction there. Not just how does the ecosystem itself change as well as what it could supply to uh, adjacent ecosystems. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that's a great idea. You could sort of, you could sort of look at carbon as a currency. You know, if you're wasted, you're losing. So, uh, and one example I, I showed today was this issue with uh, CO2 by extreme events in uh, estuaries, which is a, it's a loss, and also potentially it adds to the extremists you know, if, you, if you believe the evil cycle, so to speak. So that's, that would be a good selling point, is equating carbon as sort of a currency, you know, that, that would uh, ring with a lot of folks. Yeah. Oh, and one thing, one more thing. Uh, the, uh, you know, speaking of mitigation, 
there's always the folks, there's always, sorry about this, Joey, but there's always the engineers in the room, and they always get their feet in the room first before uh, find your chemists and folks that uh, have uh, other solutions to solve the problems. Uh, you know, good example is uh, Lake Okeechobee, for example, which is, has been a miserable failure in terms of uh, dealing with more extreme events. And the engineer's answer is, well, you just got to build the next higher, right? And so uh, I think we have to have to show that we, we have, we're working on novel approaches. Yeah, I, I think that's part of the, you know, the communication. And um, I also just sort of thought in terms of the, the societal thread as well, or is it too broad to think about making products that not just in the academic world or you know in the adult world would be useful? Is it too broad to at least begin thinking about content and information that could be useful at like a K through 12 level? Um, sorry, I can't see your face. Oh, um, I'm not sure how much they're read or used in classrooms, but the Frontiers journals have a Frontiers for Kids um, series. So they you can write like a review kind of article or um, like a conceptual explaining a topic and you choose the um, age group. And then it's actually peer reviewed by kids of that age, whether or not they found it interesting oh, or, <laughs> or accessible. Um, and then and then it's published, and that's something we like put on the website and like share with those people too. So that could be a project for the uh, communications group. That's that's a great idea. Okay, I tell you what. As a facilitator, I'm going to uh, we're going to do this activity, hot potato. So Joey's going to start with Maggie. I know you just said something. If you'd like to share anything else about this workshop, maybe what you, what's the most important thing you learned? I know we already talked about this, but let's talk about it again. And just go around and have some feedback. Yeah, you don't have to say anything. You just pass the hot potato if you don't want to say anything. We'll start and then pass to your right. And just go around the room. So give me a chance to think of something. Uh, something that you want us to say something we've learned or something that we think is important? Either or. Whatever. Comes share, to share, open share, mic. open mic. Exactly right. Um, okay, well, I mean, uh, thank you for letting me come to this meeting. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and um, I really enjoyed the breakout groups and discussing um, kind of sites and time scales and um, and and standardization and data things. So those are things that I'm really interested in keeping to talk about as we go forward this project. Hey, I'm also a jeweler's question. I feel like what potato here. The first thing that's on my head is, is kind of the international slash high uh, latitude aspect. So we've talked a lot about tropical storms and, and fires, but going to the Baltic Sea, that's not so relevant there. So uh, I think that I, I'm still many feet unsure of how, how much there is like international angle or component here. Like what's what's the what's the role of international collaboration here? I understand most people here are in US and the funding is in US and all that, but is, is there is there international community involved and, and how and that's kind of questions that are going through my head right now. And I'm gonna jump in and, and when when you say yeah, something you <laughs> uh, aren't what are what extreme events do you experience in Finland? Or if you don't ex experience any you see them just <laughs> higher trophic levels and the seesaw. Well, everyone's heard enough of me. So well, we didn't get to hear the answer from Errol. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, yeah. We're not, not going to get you. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, right? <laughs> but is that okay? So is that is is there an alteration and uh, 
have, are you seeing more intense yeah. rains because of that? It's yeah. not just tropical cyclones, remember. Exactly. Not yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's the same phenomena, but framed in different ways. So heat waves, uh, alteration in strength and timing of precipitation, uh, snow melt happening uh, in, in springs, which might be turned, uh, changing their uh, frequency and, and in, the, in the forest. And, and then we have forest clear cutting, which is an extreme event in nature. We're uh, getting rid of our dam, dams, hydroponic dams. So I think there are a bunch of, uh, and then we have, we don't have, but our neighbors have glaciers that are melting or permafrost that's melting. So that kind of extremes that are specific for higher latitudes. So I think part of our challenge as well is going to, how do we convince that it's a societal and global problem? I mean, we you, you had a, you removed the slide, Hans, but you have a, you had a slide that said, you know, this is a global problem. But I think that's important too. Not just a, you know, what's the extent of the effect of the extreme events? We need to communicate how widely uh, they're felt. Very briefly, you know, I, I brought up this currency thing, and I think that that might be a really good selling point that we value uh, maintaining carbon. You know, in a in a state where it's going to be beneficial, not detrimental, uh, and whatever we learn could could help that. I think so. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Uh, this is Carl Hazard from Texas A&M. So for me, the last two days, basically, like the discussions like expanded my view on, on actually all the processes, all the the linkages between the different events and, and ecosystem responses. So that was one. And as I just got back from the Arctic, actually, you know, so where you see those changes dramatically, and actually First Nations talking about it, there's this urgency, actually. And that's all we talked about. So, yeah. Yeah, um, it's actually been a real pleasure to be here these last couple of days. I thought like we had some really great discussions. So thank you all for bringing your expertise and backgrounds and engaging in these, in these dialogues. It's important. Um, I have already been talking about this case. So I'm not sure what you're going to say again, but um, I would say the one thing that strikes me is uh, partnerships. We all have different expertise. We all have different lived experiences. And when we come together, we can do great things. And that's what I think this um, to build a discussion this morning about how to educate. It's the beginning of building a community. We're really just starting to identify what can each other bring and what kind of conversations do we need to have. None of this is easy from the interfaces between ecosystems, the, the atmosphere as a role, the terrestrial ecology as a role, disasters themselves have a role, the body ecosystems have a role, how all these different processes and carbon cycles across and through and, and all of those different things, they all have different uh, importances and they all matter when you're starting to think about these bigger picture kind of questions. So no one of us are going to have the answers, but it's through working together that I think we can really start to move, move all of this forward and figure out what those next steps are. Um, thank you. Uh, Libby Larson, and, uh, NACP coordinator, and um, I probably was just going to echo a lot of the same essentials, and but in terms of thinking about it, that it was my coordinator hat on, and also a little bit of an extra hat as well. And, um, and I just want to say that I, I've been really impressed, not just sort of with learning a lot more about this, these particular topics, both from sort of the extreme events side and the carbon side and pointing those together, but but also I've just been really impressed with the uh, with the um, process of this meeting and the workshop and how well it's gone and how engaged everybody has been. And it seems I'm pretty I'm really excited about the potential stuff that's going to come out of this. So that's fine. Hi, Greg Noe, U.S. GS two points. One, I guess it's a very interdisciplinary problem, and it's critical, but our distraction brains sometimes. So this is a great entree into it and uh, necessary for progress. But the second point I want to make quickly is that, as I talked about yesterday, history really matters to frame what is extreme. And one thing we haven't talked a lot about is the potential use of traditional indigenous knowledge to identify what the history of extreme has been in the past that may not be in the modern instrumental record. Uh, 
I think well, you and Sue will need to. Um, I'm really happy that you accepted me to come to this workshop. Uh, one of the things that uh, Greg and I was talking about is how some of these extreme events are now affecting places that we don't expect them to be. You know, Wilmington, New Bern, sure, it's always going to be there, Florida, Miami, but Sandy Hook, the United Kingdom, I mean, Greenland, these are really weird places to get a tropical cyclone. And, um, and, and these are places that we don't have baseline data to, uh, you know, to look at some of the effects of these extreme events. So maybe we should also kind of think of it globally that, that way, I guess. Um, I would absolutely plus one that, and I think, uh, you know, also with the fires, right, you've got these very far distant effects. Um, so, you know, I think that really is the way to tell the story, get to the, you know, connect with people, right? If you Especially if you're you know, thinking about climate change, it is something distant that can actually affect you locally. And people are thinking locally, right? Um, so I'd be interested in something where there's an effort to try to tell some of the stories. I don't think people really connect, um, you know, in the West, for example, the typhoons are recurring and then actually can affect Alaska with large storms and affect weather in the Western United States. And actually, so the remnant moisture from hurricanes starts fires in California to lightning strikes, right? Um, in terms of the atmosphere. So making some of those big connections might be a way to, uh, you know, tell kind of a couple of stories with these really extreme events and how they actually have these you know, global scale or really large scale effects. Um, and that's something that to me is really interesting. The one other thing I want to say process wise, was what's happening with mentoring polls, and should we do one to help guide some of the next steps? You know, not, we always have a problem with the carbon cycle top down versus bottom up, so maybe we should get some bottom up with the top down. <laughs> John is our mentor. We're, we've, we're skipping this row. Oh. It was, it was past part. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, all right, all right. All right. I don't want to be prescriptive. You got a groove going. Just run with it. Okay, yeah, a little jazz. I think a lot of the keywords that I just kept hearing over and over again were standardization, communication, baseline, um, coming up with vocabulary and variables and units to use across all the disciplines that we share. And also, thank you for letting me come to this conference. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm an oceanographer and I'm really excited about some of the results. Um, not, not that it's a good thing that Australia was on fire, but the fact that diatoms are wooden in the Southern Ocean because of it, I, I just want to, yeah, I want to do something with that. But I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm a little bit more curious now is if you, if you burn that much organic matter and you stimulate organic matter in these massive, massive regions of the ocean, what is the balance to that carbon? Is it, I mean, is the seeding of iron in these HML seed regions helping to wipe some of that out? Um, I don't know if that, if you have a mechanism like that, it gets enough to wipe out of all the CO2 released from the storms that we were hearing about this month, but nonetheless, these are just, there's a lot of wheels spinning about. It's been interesting. Hi, I wanted to uh, refer to the Center for Climate Change Research Center for um, I have been so uncomfortable, and I really appreciate that because it's been a lot of learning. Uh, so I'm going to echo what I just said in that um, if we're starting to look at global impacts, I think we really need to have a good handle on mass transport and uh, budget, specifically with related respect to uh, Carbon, but also some of these other major nutrients that we're interested in. Where is it coming in to the atmosphere? Where is it going out? Hi, I'm Tina Geller from the University of Colorado Boulder. Thank you for letting me have this conference. Uh, on the communication side, I was just thinking about like the stakeholders that we wanted to reach out to, but then also how this really is a global issue that involves 
pretty much everyone on earth. Um, and getting maybe like another way of communicating to the general public of just like one sentence that tells a story that we can share. Um, because people like generally don't remember too much of what like they read and then they don't remember who they hear it from. So I don't know, maybe finding like pictures to tell the story or a comic strip or something could be like a fun way of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't have another uh, mic, but uh, it's not. Uh, as also part of the presentations, we should have a Twitter. Uh, and uh, uh, here we go. No, no, no. Just this is just a follow up. Okay. Yes. Can you say that again, just so we can get it recorded? So, in addition to um, our other communication projects, we should have a Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Mohamed Abisha from the University of South Carolina. And for me, it was lots of learning over the past couple of days. Um, one thing I want to bring in actually, um, there is an NSF call for planning proposals for um, related to fires. And that's something I'm interested in, like exploring with other people hopefully tomorrow um, and looking to probably building a team around that topic. Hopefully. Great, thank you. NASA? NSF. NSF. It's a DR colleague letter planning grants. Yeah. Fires? Yeah. It's on fire too. Yeah, the community building grounds. Oh, yeah. It's similar to what we did, what we are doing here, but focus on fires. So, yeah. So, hopefully, we can get some, some people to go tomorrow. Yeah, I think we have <laughs> Lord Johnson and Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversations both in the the channels or in, in session and out of session. It's been extremely interesting to see different groups working on different topics and kind of merging towards one specific question, which is which is very interesting. But just the networking, the potential of Collaboration is, is is really really awesome. Hi, so Douglas Hamilton at uh, North Carolina State University. Um, I guess I'm just going to sort of guess uh, at this point now. Um, from my point of view, coming in as a as a um, it's been really interesting to kind of think about processes so on something that isn't actually really represented with the nervous systems, and then think about what that might actually mean. And um, when I kind of go back to development and things like that. Um, and I think it's interesting in also this kind of society question that's, that's coming up as well. So um, I don't know anything about coastal kind of society, really. so is that kind of question of the wise society care and then that kind of thing is kind of coming up, I think it's a, it's a good one, not necessarily just for society, but also for other scientists, um, as well as kind of engage uh, our disciplines and talk about that. And maybe just one last thing. Um, so a lot of groups um, have uh, connections via Future Earth, because that's another thing you might want to think about doing. And um, so Future Earth becomes an umbrella for, um, for all of the other umbrellas. Um, but through that, actually, they, they actually communicate with each other in a way. So just throw that out there. But, um, they're, they're quite a, a good umbrella umbrella. Uh, Sasha Wagner, and um, I really enjoyed the last few days and really looking forward to tomorrow. Um, I'm really glad I got to speak here. Um, but I also, as somebody who like plays in freshwater and in the ocean, it's been really cool to like kind of live in this you know transitional uh, area that is undergoing a lot of change and extreme events. And so it's been really wonderful to stretch my brain in those ways. Um, I'm also excited to like try and stretch my own brain in different ways in terms of like um you were talking a lot about communication in different ways i feel like i struggle and kind of the stakeholder reach outreach type thing so i kind of want to try and get more experience there um kind of more on the modeling biogeochemistry aspect i sort of live in the organic geochemistry biogeochemistry world and so it's really exciting to see models that are actually using you know our data and kind of these really fine scale rates so that they can be scaled in the near and far future so i'm really excited to like be a part of that and um and see that our data is going somewhere you know sometimes i feel like especially with the pandemic it's a sort of like 
are creating our own data and putting it out there, but it's really cool to see that we can scale this. So I'm excited about that. And I didn't know Duke University. So I look around and I see a lot of really great, excited people. And I want to think about where we are going to be in 10 years. Are we going to be back somewhere and we're moved up? And I'm thinking about next steps. And what are the reasonable low hanging fruits we can address to kind of move forward to getting to that place we want to be in five to 10 years? So I'm being a bit pragmatic, but I want to I keep the momentum going in a positive way. This is Allison Myers Bay from Pacific Northwest National Lab, and I just want to build on that where I feel like this has been such a great community that you guys have assembled, and this is really a starting point. Um, and there's a lot of momentum right now. And so thinking about ways that we can actually um, continue that momentum and not, you know, all go back to our corners of the world and never speak again, right? So I was thinking um, one thing that we could do is maybe build like a Slack community or something where we can like chat and, and, and share, you know, pause all the time, share, you know. Uh, development of these ideas of just having sort of like a virtual playground for us to to live on when we all go back to our real world. Okay, I'm sorry, but can you tell me what Slack is? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. One of the many options of uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's like I'm like email also horrific. I have like sixteen thousand right now. So you know, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a way. Yeah. To no, it's continue communicating without losing you know momentum. So. <laughs> wow. Oh my. Um, okay. Yeah. After uh, ninety days. Uh, oh, yeah, that's yeah. 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 It, it's a suggestion of a forum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. A yes. forum. We can build a crowd. Yeah. No, we can build. Discord? That one I've heard of. That, this, I was going to ask that. I mean, how, you know, we could use that mechanism as well. And, and maintain it. That sounds hard. Good. Yeah, Kevin Ryan, USGS. So I'm actually glancing over at Libby because I, I don't know if it's appropriate to mention the NSCP Discord group that was started recently this year and trying to gain momentum over there. So, um, you want to talk about I can throw the mic to you. Yeah, there's lots of channels on there. Um, you know, there's general, there's mentorship, there's ideas, there's proposals, funding opportunities, um, announcements, cat things, um, lots of, you know, it's just like it's a, cat. Cat. It's it's cat. Space. Uh, so this sort of chat around topics and not have to be receiving a whole ton of emails in your email box. Like you, you go and you log in, look at so it's it's actually very similar to Slack, but it's, it's a different form. Right? Yeah. Okay. And, and it exists. It exists. And um, I, don't, I don't know how we can get linked to that on it, but uh, maybe you can maybe put that in there. Um, yeah. But I, didn't, I don't mean to over no, no, no. Uh, invite or whatever. But um, <laughs> I guess my specific comment with the, the workshop is uh, you know, as far as a product, I think. That the management implications of what we've been discussing are really important, you know, or maybe more important than a synthesis paper listing all the complex processes that exist in this interface. Uh, and so, for fires, I'm thinking it, when humans manage fire, they're managing for loss, uh, prevention of loss of human life, uh, property, human health. But can we do anything to add an additional layer on there for how we prevent or fight fires? Uh, for ecosystem uh, resilience or health for carbon storage. Uh, so that would be my one specific question. And that, that has economic context as well. Yeah, yeah so, so that's a nice connection there. Yeah, and traditional knowledge is being, is being whispered in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go behind you? Where do some people? Yeah. Uh, I'm Kelsey Bessay from Oregon State University. Uh, one thing that this is a selfish 
let me help the in a moment, but I came to the conference uh, from a perspective of really wanting to get other people interested in mobilizing around wildfire events. And so before we leave tomorrow, I'd like to know, like the people in the room would like to have data next time there's a wildfire, what kind of data they need and understand who's on the ground and who would be locally near so that we can collaboratively work together and at least make the most of a situation that I think, you know, we can uh, seriously. So I guess fine. <laughs> uh, hi, this is Chakra from Texas A&M Corpus District. First of all, thank you for letting me come here and attend this workshop. And two days was a big learning curve for me. I use um, various models to quantify and um, or the analysis of DOM. So I use various variables across discipline to better understand the qualities. So these two days of listening to this talk. So it's going to help me uh, make better models. Thank you. Josh Leonard, Texas a &M. Uh, This has been a really eye opening experience for me, and uh, I've learned a ton. And uh, it uh, seems obvious that the earth is changing and uh, like pretty rapidly. And but these biogeochemical cycles are pretty resilient to extreme changes, and that uh, they've evolved over millions of years to be resilient to extreme events. And that uh, we need to kind of emphasize maybe to the public that, like, even though extreme events are happening, that like nature can sequester carbon at rates better than any machine that they're spending millions of dollars or billions to build and that we need to be emphasizing like the strength of ecosystems and their resilience. Awesome. Thanks, Nick Ward, Ken Nell. Um, it's been awesome hearing all the cool stuff everyone's doing from a high level to going way into the weeds and breaking out the um, Something I said in our afternoon breakout or asked him on is if we get a billion dollar 20 year program studying extreme events, how, how do we know we were done with this research? What does it look like from the finish of this? Um, and our group came to the conclusion that maybe our goal or our vision is to be able to understand and predict the consequences of extreme events from a local to a global scale. And I like Hans's carbon bank account analogy. How much do we take out of the bank every time we have one of these events? And does it take to refill our bank account? Uh, I'll just say one other thing that Miguel Billy said at the last workshop I ran was you guys are all talking about some really cool stuff. Oh, it gets funded for some of you, and even if I'm not involved, that's also just what seems to happen. That's what he said. <laughs> Tom Bianchi, uh, University of Florida. <clears throat> um, as you get older, um, and you go to these workshops, you have a tendency to sort of uh, reflect on things, and I guess. One of the things is, is uh, coming into the workshop with um, just this very simple idea of the seesaw. Um, I'm, I'm finding that um, as we move through this, um, um, there's a lot more clarity in it for me relative to some of the earlier conversations we had. But one of the other things I think that's interesting here is um, when you think about this, this place that we're talking about, the land, uh, ocean interface uh, and how this is being um, disturbed in this more chaotic world. It's interesting how we're here when, again, another thing that you reflect on as you get older is, is how we sort of got this mixture of people with the, with the cumulative knowledge we have that builds back over 100 years ago with Bernatsky, um in terms of the newosphere. And then you can Fast forward a little bit, you have Bob Costanza talking about the kind of currency that Hans is talking about and the value of, of wetlands. Um, you move another 50 years up from that and sort of have essentially um, blue carbon people um, sort of taking what Bob talked about in a very different way and, and incorporating that sequestration part of it. Right? Um, and then the other thing that this whole um, aggregation of, of ideas that we've had over the last few days integrates is essentially something else that the earth science people uh, talk about a lot, and it's the source to sink idea and the aquatic continuum being within that source to sink. So 
if you look at this little hot spot that we've been talking about um, and how that sort of integrated knowledge went all the way back to human disturbance, um, even the outwelling hypothesis, right, from back in the 70s, all of that really collectively fits into a lot of the conversation I've been listening to. And I, that's one of the things that starts to happen as I see what you grow. And the final thing I'll say from the older side of what I'm thinking is it's just been so refreshing to get out of my house and to be with people that I really enjoy being around. And I'm extremely impressed um, with the clarity and articulation that uh, the younger scientists are able to communicate with these days. I, I typically come to myself criticizing that generation for the cell phones and all that. But um, <laughs> despite that, I'm extremely impressed. And I think it's, you know, they're a good, good, good group to be passing the baton on. <laughs> Thank you. City Victor ACU. I uh, the first night of the lightning talk, the title of my talk was Mother Nature Bats Last. And um, I don't think I explained the analogy. If you throw up the bat in a baseball game, usually the people at the end are some of the heaviest hitters. And um, I still sort of maintain that. But one of the things I think that it's really great coming out of this is that. We have now, as a result of this group, I think, really gotten an appreciation for system science. I think the perspectives everyone has brought together in each recent session come together has just really highlighted how system science works, how all of this is connected. And, and you know, one place something happened here is affecting a cycle over there. So it's just been great to to see the interconnection of some of the um, you know, some of the, the highlights of the workshop. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, uh, the last thing I was going to say is that um, we should definitely do something so this is sustainable. Um, I've been to a lot of workshops where we just sort of were one and done and um, I'd love to see something sustainable from this This uh, what we see the basket uh, from my uh, FAU. Uh, great today's uh, learned a lot of uh, stuff. As an environmental emotion singing uh, person, and I always want to know about the biology of chemistry and how to to the models. Uh, learned a lot about the long term uh, ecological research data sets that are available. So, um, and we we'll have a bunch of knowledge about it. And uh, regarding the RFPs, what we discussed. Um, probably uh, it's also a good idea to look at uh, the foundations and the nonprofits if it's available. In case of Miami, we have Miami water keepers, biscuit watchers, or some of those things, then locally. So maybe uh, that's an interesting um, aspect uh, to, to look into planning uh, regarding uh, meeting that. Probably, as a, uh, anyone is coming to AGU, probably we can actually have to get together at AGU uh, for a season. Good. Uh, John Kamanowski, also from Ford International University, and I'm glad to be here because I actually just met Shudar uh, this meeting, even though we're at the same university. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is. Thanks, cool. Um, I think, I've got, like, midway through this workshop, I was starting to have the William Shepard overview effect, like, this is massive, what are we doing? You know, overwhelmed, but... Um, it's nice to hear that others are feeling overwhelmed and encouraged at the same time, and that, um, that there is repetition of ideas that have built some of the foundations of the fields of ecology and other disciplines, and that carbon is, um, is a common currency, and that and people understand it a, a lot, we're trying to understand a lot more. And so um, I do hope that this is the, the seeds of a network, and that we, you know, in 10 years, I hope we have graduate students working together and um, that we can build this sort of slow but steady and um, that uh, yeah I think this is I will say too that this 
and I'm not saying this just because I was on the science organizing committee, but this is the most diverse group of people I've interacted with at a workshop um, from all elements and intersections of diversity. So that's cool. Whoops. You're here. Um, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I got you too, but I'm going to start with the because I'm holding it in and I can't. So I'm taking off the program manager, bird's eye, you know, vehicle on the plane hat, and I'm going to go back to my paleoceanography roots. And I want to talk about sediments and sedimentary processes because I hear, I've heard it over and over again at this meeting. And that is a part of the seesaw. We have the least amount of data. We have the, 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 the capacity to parameterize these processes in a model depends on how much data we have. And this, in my mind, is a really important part of the continuum in determining whether or not the carbon and nutrients are mobilized and shipped out or whether they stick around and get sequestered. And when it comes to extreme events or CDR or anything that we're talking about, we got to nail that down. And I'm also thinking, you know, it, it's important from a process perspective, but everybody's talking about paleo again, which has got me really excited. All my paleo is in the open ocean, but there's real capacity here for us to go back into the paleo record. And, you know, these coastal sediment systems probably have some pretty clear fingerprints of these extreme events. So, I want to read a couple comments from Sasha Kramer and Simone Allen, who have both been, I want to say, really dedicated participants, virtual participants in this meeting the whole time. And I want to read their comments before we move to the next person. So Sasha says, I learned a lot this week, and I'm so excited we brought this group together. One idea I have at the moment is how can we use data sets that may be unintentionally tracking extreme event impacts to look into some of these questions we've raised. Coastal time series observations that encompass a period with extreme event or large disturbance like a cyclone or a fire might be the place to start. Also, historical record and remote sensing data are relevant measurements for boring to biogeochemical floats. Simone Allen says, I have learned a lot and liked Chris's three topical areas. While I don't have a lot of time to contribute to pushing any of them forward, I'd be interested in being involved in them to help represent the ocean acidification, marine CDR, NOAA carbon, and international CO2 data management perspectives that might be germane to the efforts emerging from the workshop. Really appreciating the comments about societal relevance, environmental justice, and traditional knowledge. Yes, this has been a great workshop. Um, I'm pretty excited to hear a lot more about fire. Um, I've never really thought about it that much. I think living on the East Coast for the last eight years in Maryland, um, even though I grew up in California, I just out of sight, out of mind, I suppose. But um, seeing some of the really interesting research from the people who uh, focus on fire for the work has got me pretty excited to perhaps integrate some of that into what I do, which is coastal ocean biogeochemistry. Um, the other thing is I'm really excited to see some of these data sets like Modmon and others, and I look forward to see, seeing them all in one place eventually. And we can look at some of these trends and start teasing apart when these new events might have been captured from other programs um, throughout the country and the world. Uh, but I'm on a level to sit in National Lab um, and echo a couple of things. Um, I really appreciate, of course, the interdisciplinary group of scientists we have here, especially myself coming from the terrestrial side. I'm trying to work on the way to the coast, but I <laughs> primarily work on the terrestrial side and on the fire side. I really appreciate, of course, how fire is being recognized as actually important. Um, and representing very linkage, um, we're talking about you know, the impacts of the extreme events in the terrestrial landscape and connectivity with the coast um, and, and the ocean of those processes. Um, I also wanted to echo that I really like um, Hans Carbon's currency uh, sort of philosophy. Uh, I find myself when I talk to my family, my friends who are not scientists, thinking about climate change, I often try to put it in a term that they understand. And oftentimes people understand money and how that impacts 
past that. So I, I like that idea, but I also exercise caution a little bit. I think the people in North Carolina may remember this, but of course the state legislator 10 years ago you know, tried to ban the scientific consensus on sea level rise and making coastal policy because they felt uh, there was fear mongering and things. So I think we also have to think about how we communicate this so that it resonates with people, but also at the same time doesn't scare people. You know, people can't see sea level rise, but they can see the destruction of hurricanes, the destruction of fire. So there's a little bit of difference there. But I think um, how we communicate this issue with folks uh, who uh, don't do science or are critical uh, it is going to be important in, in some of our next steps and bringing on the social science impacts and the discussions. Um, Nicole, Blake, and uh... Well, my time, and this is big margarine, can't take much more in it, but I'll just say that it's been uh, exciting to see what I think is an emergent philosophy, scientific philosophy coming out that I think in 10 years is just going to be, uh, we're going to, people are going to look back and think that it was, this is one of the most important things people could have done because we're looking at big global scale problems. And uh, so, my words of advice, not that you asked, is be incredibly persistent because the road's going to be bumpy, but this is too important to let go. Um, hi, Ariana Sutton Greer at USGS. Um, this has been totally fun. Um, and I just have really enjoyed being out of my comfort zone. I'm going to second that one. Um, and uh, so thank you to all of you, because this has just been really great. Um, I am most interested in our so what, how do we connect with stakeholders and society and the public? So that's the piece of this that I'm most intrigued with. But I think that's partly because it's clear to me that many of you in this room have so much more knowledge about some of the intricacies of how these processes work that I'm probably best used in the bigger picture stuff. So that's where... That's where I'm excited to connect with all the stuff that's happening and how we all, you know, we develop these bigger models and answer big questions, and then we can explain why does that matter. So that's that's what has me more excited uh, to work on tomorrow and follow you. Chris Schultz, Princeton JPL. Um, so coming from uh, the Earth System Modeling Society, I think what Douglas said that this is uh, the land ocean material is now represented in Earth System Models, and that's something that you hear over and over again that we need to do something about it. Um, this is important, but it's a problem because the land people don't talk to the ocean people, and there is a lack of communication. So it's just very refreshing to see people show their faces, and as imperfect as communication might have been at times, because you know it is true that we come from different backgrounds. Um, I think they all agree on some things that are important and some mechanisms that we need to understand. And um, it, it's really cool to see people make an effort to um, try to bridge this divide and come up with some, uh, some, some terms that we can all agree on. And some uh, spatial and temporal scales as well. And I think there's a broad recognition of connecting uh, small scales to large scale things and, you know, how these effects may happen somewhere, but they may not stay there. And uh, what can we do about it? So I'm just really looking forward to, you know, looking at imperfect data, working with the imperfect plans we came up with and making some imperfect flaw so that we can take it from there. Hi, this is uh, Mohammed. I came in from Kuwait to the university. So actually it took me like 24 hours to fly from Kuwait to be here. And uh, I'm really thankful to be around you know, this diverse people and uh, especially to reconnect it again with some of my professors and my friends. And uh, actually, you know, I've been, you know, really into the administration job in Kuwait and I feel alive again right now. <laughs> and, uh, I think it's time to release the beast inside. <laughs> So uh, one of the things, like, I, I usually think about extreme events. It's like, you know, the catastrophic events that people passed away and uh, a loss of damage. But what I've learned here that also we could consider, like, hypersaline situation to be maybe extreme events, especially in the Gulf, in Kuwait. So the saline used to be, like, 36, 37, now it jumps to 41. 
so, you know, I didn't thought about it this way. So really expand uh, my knowledge in terms of uh, what's the real definition of extreme uh, events and what sh we should consider as extreme event and what's not. Uh, also, like I, I might suggest something like what, like when you said we need to to design our, uh, a website. So if we could have like a map of the world, like you know all the experts in the map. So you know like let's say within the Mediterranean, we have those people who are really they conduct research in uh, uh, you know related extreme event or the CISO research. Let's say in India, and the Arabian Gulf. You know, so you can easily access. Those ex yeah, experts around the world, you're using the map, you know, just you click on the on this ocean itself, and you, you, know, you have the list of the names who you can easily uh, communicate with. And uh, so, something, uh, so I'm really grateful to be here. And uh, in two days, so another 24 hours back home. <laughs> David Lagmasino, East Carolina University. Um, I'll say three things. I think the C and CISOL should be care and what we actually care about. I, mean, I think last year we're talking about carbon, we care about that. But as you were saying, my mom doesn't care about carbon, my brother doesn't care about that. Um, they care about your money or their house or their farm or whatever. Like that's what we have need to sort of put together to think about our data as representing along those lines, not just necessarily carbon. Um, two, I don't think it's ever too early to bring in social scientists. We say we're interdisciplinary. We're missing out on a big chunk there that are actually going to be about uh, TDK, traditional ecological knowledge. Who's bringing that in? That's going to be the social scientist. Right? And policy folks talk about uh, a hurricane looking different the next time. Well, people are changing and responding to that. Policy changes. Construction changes, all of these things that planning and management go into these aspects, excuse me, these aspects that are changing after uh, extreme events. Uh, and lastly, I'm surprised actually no one's going to mention it, but we have an interesting venue that's coming up soon, COP27, that is going to be all about the things that we're talking about this, this week. Um, and yes, it's only in a couple of weeks, but I think we have. The communications group be able to share some of this stuff in live tweets if we have a Twitter account or something that can connect with COP27 as the meeting's going. Hi, I'm Binti Liu from the Water Institute of the COP. Uh, I really appreciate the CSO committee uh, organizing this fantastic workshop and also appreciate you all the great presentations and posters. And it's a big learning curve for me. I gain um, great carbon knowledge from different aspects and uh, perspective. I mostly study carbon from remote sensing and optical environments. So for me, I'm really, really excited to, um, to see the application of the pace and the glamour for the carbon world. And uh, beyond that, I'm from Louisiana. You know that we are frequently influenced by the extreme events like hurricanes. During the pandemic, we experienced the four major hurricanes. We trying to go out and do the sampling for both wetlands and estuaries. Um, it, it, it has been tough. And um, the good thing is that the stakeholders in Louisiana, they Louisiana care about the carbon so much. And beyond my research, we are also running a state research program that supports um, um, the research on um, the restoration uh, of coastal Louisiana and trying to maximize um, the carbon benefits from each project. I think the great knowledge I learned today and great inputs from you all will guide us to develop our research about carbon and uh, the next RFP. Thank you. Thank you all. Hi, Erin Heenan, uh, University of Nevada, we know. Um, I'll keep it brief because <laughs> Dina and Allison kind of said what I already wanted to say. <laughs> but um, one thing I will just add to that, this is a totally new group of people for me, and I'm really fun learning from everybody here. So I'd love to keep learning from people, and it might be cool to also add some sort of, on the website, so people can put their favorite papers about how land and ocean processes are linked, um, so we can continue to learn things from each other. Thanks.
Hi, uh, Julia Moriarty, Steve Boulder. Um, I've really enjoyed being here this week. I'm going to echo both Neil and Mohammed in that I'm very tired, <laughs> but that I've got taken, got so much energy, like scientific, you know, creative energy from this meeting. It's really been great. Um, and I've especially enjoyed learning about fires, which I never really think about. Um, I think in terms of things I'll take away from this meeting, uh, one of the ideas that keeps coming up for me is the idea of compound events. and not just in terms of magnitude of fluxes, but in terms of how those compound events are um, affecting the transformation of material um, along the way as well. Um, and I especially appreciate that that idea came from one of the fire talks, I think, fire talks originally. Um, yeah, thank you. I think the next year, it's so we had a, a big group made of about data science. Uh, I come from a different background, <clears throat> and so professionally, besides learning about science, I also learned about this group data case, and how it gets funding, how it solves problems, how it leverages resources, and I, I think that's what I like to hear about that. Probably my big idea that I would share is that this group, my opinion is that communication is the most important issue both with each other but also with the public outreach we have uh, not just to the, the local public but to the global public there's a huge amount of knowledge here if you can share that in an effective way good storytelling to the public people will get it through one of them i'll invite juniors at the university um happy to be here some of the things that I really talk about a lot of so the so crystallized for me is what is coastal. So we're always talking about coastal, but we don't have very good boundaries. So how far inland, how far up to the ocean. So I think that definition is pretty clear. Then also what's extreme. So are we just talking about moving away from the baseline condition or somewhere at the tails of the distribution? And then kind of getting back to those, I really like to draw figures. And so, uh, and this is kind of chiming in on uh, our friend from Finland who said, well, we don't have these type of extreme events. I think it'd be important to put together a geographic distribution of what events happen where, and that helps us better understand uh, how we can take some knowledge that comes to one type of extreme event, how it can translate to another place. And then also just uh, thinking very critically about the spatial temporal distribution of extreme events. So droughts don't happen for a hundred years. They tend to happen for very short periods of time. They can cover very large regions. So getting a better grasp of how those things are distributed uh, spatial, spatial temporal. Uh, Ruben Wilson, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Thank you for letting me infiltrate this workshop. Um, so I can't really say much that hasn't already been said already. Uh, but what I'd like to encourage a lot of people to do is, you know, continue looking to places where you have received funding, but look in other places as well. Because the Department of Agriculture, U.S. Pacific, of course, I'd love to come see a moose for sandstorm poetry grade. Unfortunately, Uncle Sam won't do that. Um, but look at these unconventional sources of funding and partnerships. So I see a lot of people talking about not necessarily having the resources to go collect data where they want to. Um, the unit I operate in, we bring our own boats, we bring our own people, you know, we're trained soil scientists, you'll have to help us in the water. Um, but we're here to help, you know, that's another unit extended from a government entity that's here to help you do this work and generate this vital data that we need for our modelers and making these decisions. Uh, I guess I don't mind yet. Probably last. Is anybody else not wrong? Um, Joey Crosswell, CSIRO. Uh, just kind of thinking something different to say. Um, we've mentioned a couple times, uh, only a couple, um, but potential in industrial or industry partnerships. Um, that is the I in CSIRO. And I often forget that, um, you know, what benefits those partnerships can have. Number one, it creates a very powerful story. And it's not always um, just for, uh, you know, benefiting for-profit companies. There are a lot of um, industrial funders out there as well, looking to for for meaningful purposes to apply their tools. And I think this, you know, fires and cyclones are something that's kind of sexy in that regard. Um, and I think it can have a, a lot of benefits for us as well. Um, uh, example of just getting like communications and different different groups and the message out in different ways.
Excellent. Well, thanks, everybody. I mean, I'm not going to, I can't add anything else. That's why you guys filled up this time. But this is a scoping workshop. We're here to get information and get feedback from everybody participate. And so I think this was an important exercise to have this reflection. We're not done. We're not done. I know Julia is tired, but we got it. We still got it. We still got to go uh, uh, and, and, and do some more work tomorrow. So we have the three different groups that I mentioned, um, and we're getting some feedback here from uh, the mentee. And what we'll do when we start tomorrow, and we will start in here, tomorrow's food will be downstairs in 3222, but we will be in here. Uh, we'll have a, a, a breakout group, but we're gonna take the first part of the morning to, um, to talk about what we'll, we'll do in the breakouts. I think this is what our working dinner is gonna be like tonight, really uh, fine tune this. But I've made some, some really, uh, well, not detailed, but some uh, voluminous notes here under our uh, data and observational program and communication groups. But I also heard uh, related to some other uh, discussions that I heard the last two days, um, you know, we could have a subgroup that's interested in working on proposals or proposal ideas, at least sketching out what are some potential proposal ideas that we could come up with. That can inform who we reach out to uh, and how we try to communicate what we want to do. Um, we had the, the science organizing committee did have the idea of having a proposal pitch type session, and this might be a kind of a good subgroup if we want to do that. So we will, uh, the, the SOC will iterate on this um, and, and we'll, we'll get back together uh, tomorrow morning, all refreshed, and then uh, do our final breakout and then come into here and have uh, a little uh, wrap up again. Uh, just another logistic point, before we break tomorrow and adjourn, we will have a, uh, a lunch, which you can take away if you'd like, if you need to get to the airport or if you wanna sit out back, uh, you know, anywhere around Tally and enjoy your lunch, then we'll continue after that. So this is all for today. Thank you very much. I'm super excited about all this.